Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. This week, our guest is none other than the man, the myth, or should that be the urban myth, Terry Dempsey. But before that, some Nash news with Tommy Foreman. All yeah. right, mate. How I'm are all you? Right, mate. Good. You? Massive news this week, mate, for you. Super League, you're a Spurs fan. Disgraceful. Uh, yeah, it's been a yeah, it's been a weird week, hasn't it? As a how, football fan. How have you been deemed one of the top six clubs, mate? No idea. Embarrassing. All how, round football, mate. You wouldn't see Leicester City getting away with that, mate. They'd be like, no. Mate, Leicester City should be in there all day ahead of Tottenham for the last three or four years. Top one. I don't know. It's been a it's been an absolute shambles, to be honest with you. Um it's not been a good week to be a Spurs fan. Unless you didn't like Jose Mourinho, which I didn't really anyway. So it's quite a, the, the, a positive from a negative is that... He, he listens to these, Jose. <laughs> we've got rid of him. Fresh start and all. No Super League because we've all pulled out, thankfully. Although it's not gone down well with the fans, has it? It's going to take a bit of rebuilding that for them to put their trust in the owners and that again. But just a bit of a shambles, isn't it? I don't like football at the moment. Let's go. To what we all like. We yeah, fishing, exactly. Mate. Let's talk about fishing. Cause... And what I've got to talk about, especially mm. with you, because you are Mr. Zig, is Zig fishing. It is ideal out there at the moment. As we look, f- yeah, just creeping through the blinds there. It's, uh, it's a lovely day out there. The sun is shining. And uh, what are we on now? Mid End of April? Mid April? Like End of April, yeah. Last- so it's just prime. It is just prime Zig fishing weather, as the last couple of days have proven for myself. And not that I've caught anything. Well, you just hinted there that you might have, mate. Well, You've had ha- a few, haven't you? I have had a few, not on zigs, but I have been trying the zigs. It just it just wasn't happening. It's been weird, man, everywhere. The lads have just come back from a filming trip, haven't they, 10 days, and that was hard to go in, apparently. The fish are just we- been weird. I've spent a lot of time at Bluebell these last few weeks, since 29th, since it reopened. I've, every possible second I've been up there because I thought it was just going to kick off from the off. And it hasn't really. It's been really challenging. For, not just for me, for everyone on all the lakes. found myself flitting about here, there and everywhere. Mm. Um, fish are about. They're on the surface. You can watch them all day. They're just very lethargic and very... Don't know what they're doing. Uh, freezing. Of, it's, yeah. it's been a weird hit of weather, hasn't it? Freezing yeah. at night, warm in the day, mm. big drops in temperature, high pressure. Terrible conditions, really. Terrible. But... but for you, zigs, yeah. atypical conditions would be that, wouldn't they? High yeah. pressure, they would indeed. Sunshine, yeah. it's far from ideal for bottom bait fishing. Mm. Um, but zig wise, yeah, it's absolutely prime fit right about now, and it will be from now until the next. Well, there's never a bad time to use a zig, but they're really going to come into their own over the next sort of three, four weeks when the waters are just getting warmer and warmer by the day. Um, the fish are spending a large part of that day in those upper layers because the water is at its, where the water's at its warmest um, yeah it's, it's, it's game on add into that the abundance of naturals that are hatching on a daily basis I've just been down to church earlier and it's just I hadn't been down that's the first time I've been down to church in maybe a week or ten days which isn't a lot but the difference everything's just alive now like yeah. compared to like ten days ago and it's just hatches there's flies there's, it's just yeah it's kicking on it's isn't kicking it? off the naturals are in abundance and that lends itself to zig fishing perfectly so zigs for you, mate. Mm-hmm. Let's go simple. Yep. Hook pattern, hook length. And I'm guessing you use zig screws, mate, because they're the ones. Yeah, they? of course. I mean, my standards, I don't really change it, really. My standard zig setup is, uh, yeah, weed, weed leg clip. Um, perfect for the job. The leg comes off easily when needed. Uh, it's £10 zig flow, um, or 12 if I'm not allowed to use 10, if rules of the fishery. Mm. Um, zig flow is a wicked product, man. It's a lovely product. Brazen, the abrasion resistance on it, the strength of it is, is second to none. Um, hook, yeah, zig screw. They change in colour um, depending on the situation. Talk uh, to me there. Go on, expand on that. Just, Colours. Yeah. It's, it's just, a big one, isn't it? It is a big one. Um, and it varies on lake to different lakes, different times of day, different conditions, different... It, it, there's never, there's no, it's not a right and there's not a wrong, I don't think, in terms of colour. You've just got to try it all. If I had to pick, I'd put zig screw at the moment. Um, uh, nine times out of ten, my first go, my first yeah attempt sort of turning up to a session, which I'd probably go with red screws and black foam. I just think red That's and black. as well, mate. Yeah, yeah, red and, and black. black or maybe a, a yellow screw just to, so to grab their attention. But alternatively, in t- when I'm fishing, when I just want that um, the natural... Imitation because a zig screw, a black zig screw, it, it's 
coupled with a bit of black foam, it's not a million miles away from looking like a tadpole, you know? You've got a little mm. tail coming off it, which is your sort of kick of a liner, your black foam, and it's quite a natural looking thing. Yeah. So black and black, it, it'll work. Um, I'll do that. If there's like a tag, the tadpoles normally turn up soon. Uh, not, it's a bit early for tadpoles yet, but they will turn up sort of within the next, I don't know, three to four weeks maybe or something. Mm. And then I'll be going all out black to try and imitate a tadpole because Carl lo- love them, obviously. Um, yeah, anyway, hook, yeah, so zig screw colour dependent. Foam's normally, yeah, black, brown. Yeah. We'll do a bit of colour if need be. And hook wise, yeah, floater claws. Size? Um, uh, nine times out of ten, it'll be a size ten, but I will up it to an eight. A ten? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've had big fish out. Yeah, on that, yeah, yeah. You? I just think a small hook. Um, I just think a small hook. Once it's in, it's in. If you know what I mean. I want to keep it as less conspicuous as possible. Yeah, obviously, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, because I want it to look as natural as possible, and a big size six hook isn't going to do that. However, I know people say big hooks hook them better which they do in most situations, but I just think a nice small sharp zig hook with a light bit of foam. Mm. Um, I just think once it's in, it's in, if you know what I mean. Fair. And with those floater cores, honestly, they're the best, it's the best pattern of zig floater fishing hook. Oh, yeah. mate, I love them. Yeah, they're uh, good, mate. And I've used them, they're really good. I don't lose many on them, like. Don't even, touch some wood touch, or something, mate. What are I you doing? I don't know, yeah. Um, even the barbless, like bluebells barbless, and nine t- majority of waters I'm fishing, a barbless. Yeah. It doesn't really lend itself well to zig fishing, but touch wood, you're going to have to touch. Done it for you, mate. Um, yeah, I don't lose many. And I think that's a just a, just a perfect hook. Yeah. In terms of, for you, foam, you talked about there, mainly black, but sometimes from colour. Yeah. We talked about chopping and changing. Mm-hmm. Two questions. For you, how often would you chop and change if you chucked a zig out? Yep. And foam, flavour it. <clears throat> Add anything onto it? Tip it with maggots? What What are you saying? I do. I do both. Like I've got a pot of unflavoured foam and I've got a couple of pots of flavoured foam and I carry them all with me and it just it's just decide on the day, really. Um, I wouldn't... If I had to sort of... What would I say? Percentage-wise, I don't think there's a lot in it. I think I've no. got... I'll, I'll probably fish unflavoured more than I would flavoured. So... Okay. It, it What's the flavour in if there is... That's in there. Uh, it'll just range, really. I've got a couple. I've got like um, uh, what's it called? Like a sort of a fishy, crustaceany, naturally natural yeah, flavour yeah. type thing. And then I've got a real sweet, like our uh, like our plume juice sort of thing. You know, I'll yeah. have one with a bright, blatant plume juicy, um, in your face. I guess it all comes down to the venue, really. Um, if I'm fishing, a, 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 okay, example, a, a commercial coloured lake that's yeah. full of fish high stock coloured water um, zig's going to be harder to see for the fish so I'll opt for flavour maybe and because mm. there's loads of fish in there competing and I want to catch one as quick as possible um, I'd probably opt for coloured foam coloured zig screw with a flavoured bit of foam but so if I'm fishing uh, kingy for example where the water's gin clear it's not full of fish these fish aren't homing in that they're there for the naturals, if you know what I mean. So there's mm. there's an abundance of naturals in there. Then I'll probably go for the more natural approach, which, which, which would consist of black zig screw, black bit of foam, really trimmed down, small hook, because I'm I'm just trying to imitate. Yeah, natural. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, I like that. Do you know what I mean? So it depends on the venue, basically. It all comes down to venue. Very, very nice. Last bit about zigs, mate. Mm-hmm. Obviously, they're banned on a lot of venues. Yeah. For you, if you ran a fishery, would you ban them? Would you keep them? From a fishery management point of view? From my personal experience, uh, yeah, I see no. Again, it would come down to venues. Maybe. Mm. I don't really know because I don't. Uh, I've never. I could count on one hand the amount of fish I've uh, hooked on a zig. Because primarily that's that's the fishery management perspective, isn't it? It's yeah. The fact that they get foul They get foul hooks. And also, if they're not potentially used correctly or set up correctly, they can, they can be fish trailing yeah. zigs. But. Mainly, it's the foul hooked aspect. Yes, I think foul hooked carp on zigs more often than not. I could be wrong, but I, I would say it's down to people fishing short zigs. Do you know what I mean? Yep. I know a few fisheries I've been to have said, "Yes, you can zig fish, but the zigs must be over six foot or must be." Over. And I understand that. I get that because when the fish are cruising along, not cruising, but swimming along the bottom, maybe feeding, and you're putting a two footer in front of them, I think there's more chance. To foul hook one there as opposed to a fish swimming at yeah higher two foot under the more line as well as yeah it? do you know but um yeah going from personal experience um 
I've, I've yeah, I don't. I very rarely foul hook on. And if you're zig fishing free uh, free zigs, or do you just fish one, or what would you what would you say is a starting point? Would you go all out? Yeah, if normally I'll go all out. Yeah, mm. yeah, I think that's it's, it's the age old story of you go and see someone, you go, you got any zigs out, mate? It's like, oh, I had to zig out on one rod for an hour. I didn't get a bite, so yeah. I reeled it in and put it back on the bottom. That I'm also not getting bites on. You know, so people people are still scared to commit. And we mentioned it in my podcast the other week when we done a podcast yeah. back about all the information on well, well, we've done it ourselves, all the videos and all the magazine features and that on how effective zig fishing can be. You go around the lake, no one's no one's really doing it still. Yeah. Like it's such it's it's a in this day and age where everything is on a plate for you, you can buy ready tied rigs, you can buy the, all the bait and all the thing, and it's so easy to do it. Yeah any tactic or method now it's all there for you zigs are still very very underused totally and a mega edge especially if you you might be a little bit early but if you can get them going off the top over yeah. depth zigs over depth zigging is the one mate if you can get and I tried it last week on Mallard but it was just a bit too early mm. they weren't really having it but I will go back and do it if you can get three rods on over depth zigs work out your depth <laughs> say it's like I don't know 12-30 if you can get put a marker flight out it's 12-30 if you can get a zig at 12 12-6 yeah 12-6 yeah. so you've got a little bit of little bit of um, on the top slightly over depth and then spot mixers and riser pellet over the top mate they don't see it do they they don't everyone like, fishes yeah. controllers and, and you get mm. a few venues I've seen it where the, where they sort of back off the controller because they've seen it a yeah. lot especially after they've been caught a couple of times so sure. you put those zigs out over depth they're not used to it and it's mm-hmm. it's free takes instead of one isn't it it's, it's just madness. yeah it's just presentation wise you can't you've got to be you've got to get it right though because you yeah. get a lot of you can often tell if you're if you're too over depth you get a lot of um you'll see it if you can watch the spot and you'll get a lot of aborted takes if you like big swell on the surface bang yeah. and you're not hooking them so you yeah you've got to learn from that get them down so they're just slightly over depth like you say maybe four to six inches of zig flow line on the surface like that boom um, boom, oh, boom mate and some of the takes as well <sighs> proper takes it's good fun definitely give it a go primarily get out on the bank enjoy it the weather's like this get your zigs out learn mm. from Tommy's magic and catch yourself a few mm. Do you know what I'm going to do, Tommy? Go on. I'm going to go and make a brew. Yep. And then I'm going to bring on Mr. Dempsey. But thank you very much. No problem at all. This little brief interlude. You're welcome. Big love. See you soon. Terry Dempsey. Welcome, mate, to the podcast. How are you? I'm really well, thanks, Hassan. Thank you. Thank you for coming in, mate. I massively appreciate it. Yeah, not too bad. It's not too far from me, this. My mum just lives up the road, so... I'm going to go in there and have some dinner after. Two birds, one stone. <laughs> Good it. skills, mate. Um, how have you been recently? Been doing a bit of fishing? I have, yes. Been doing a bit. I always do, like you, like you know. I've done a bit on the resis in the winter. Done a few trips up there. And uh, the last couple of weeks, I'm just starting again, fishing up at Stoneacres in Oxford. Nice, uh, mate. Doing Very a nice. couple of trips up there. So that's that's good. And uh, looking forward to well, it gets a bit warmer and we get away from these frosts that we've been having the last couple of weeks and... Been pretty savage, haven't they, overnight? It has. I, I went up, um, done Easter holidays, took my son up there, Daniel. He likes it. he loves coming out fishing for three or four days at a time. And uh it was absolutely freezing. So it was about minus four while we was up the river every morning. It was pure white, so it was unexpected. But you're still keen, yeah? Even yeah, in the cross. He's keen and, and the people up there couldn't understand that, you know, this youngster, he's he's still well keen to stay, like, let's do another night, let's do another night. So He's cut from the Dempsey cloth, yeah. mate, isn't he? Well, when I was his age, I used to sleep on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so at least he's got a bed here and three bags. <laughs> More of that to come, mate. What you've done in England, as you say there, you're still doing it now, mate. There's so much to talk about. So what we've done collectively, I've researched everything. We're going to cut it down to a few sort of key chapters, but essentially centred around a lot of angling that you have done. We're going to get you back on at some point and talk about more future, but that's probably the, some of the stone acres fish you're going to catch soon, mm. hopefully. Mm-hmm. Um, but essentially what I want to start with, mate, really, is you, your childhood, how you discovered fishing and cart fishing, mate. Because mm. that is, yeah, it's an interesting point, a starting point for all this, isn't it, mate? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, no one in my family really fished, so it was a bit odd that I ended up um, getting into my fishing. Um, but I did live not far from the River Thames. So um, I grew up in uh, Canning Town in East London, which was literally right next to the docks. Um, and the River Thames was sort of the first place I ever sort of went fishing. 
And um, a lot of the children in my street who was a bit older than me, who had rods, I used to see them sort of leaving in the morning and going fishing. And uh, and then eventually I tagged on with them. And my mum bought me a rod and a reel uh, from Robertson's Fishing Tackle in Plasto. It was old school fishing tackle. It's still going now. And um, I started fishing. And the first places that I ever fished was um, Limehouse Dock in East London and the River Thames, which there was just a lock that stopped the sort of the dock and the Thames and we used to fish the Thames there as well. So that was my first experience of fishing was, was the docks. And then I started to fish some of the other docks as well, um, which were which now is where City Airport is. Wow. So where City Airport is, if you ever fly from City Airport and you fly over them docks, um, we used to fish them docks when I was young. And, and it was amazing the way we used to, when I look back now, there used to be a lot of flat fish in there. Right. A lot of flatties. And what we used to do, we said net shrimp out the edge. We was only kids, I mean, probably about 10. Uh, we'd net shrimp out the edge, and then we'd just free line a little shrimp on a small hook, like a size 16 or a size 14, and just free line it down into the dock, and you see the little flatties come up and grab it, and that's how we used to catch them. So, that's mad, isn't it? Yeah, and then we, we'd, we'd find an old nut and bolt, Tie it on. We didn't, old nut and bolt. Yeah, well, we didn't have we no. didn't have loads of tackle. You can imagine a ten year old tackle box, especially he ain't got a lot of tackle. You know, <laughs> especially in them days, it might have a couple of spinners or whatever and a couple of floats. And we used to get like a nut and bolt. I remember it clearly. And you find a worm, and that'd be your eel rod. So you put one out for eels because there used to be a lot of big eels in the docks and in the Thames when I was young. There was, there was a lot of eels. I used to do a lot of eel fishing in the Thames. Eel angling, the dark art, mate. Mm. Jelly them and then eat them later, mate. Yeah, my nan used to <laughs> jelly them until one day I'd been using maggots and um, I'd brought this nice eel home for my nan. I was so proud to bring a Roman eel because, you know, being in East London, everyone at eels, stewed eels, jelly eels, whatever. <laughs> and um, she gutted the eel and those all maggots fell out and that was it. She never ate an eel again. <laughs> and the thought of an eel after that made her sick. And that was the end of her. <laughs> That's brilliant, mate. Yeah. That is brilliant. What was it about fishing, do you think, that sort of captivated you? Because you said there you sort of followed the, the local lads and you didn't have anybody in your family that mm. sort of was doing it. Why do you think, what is it about fishing? I, I think I had to work hard to get my fish. I don't think like I had it on a plate. So I never had anyone to show me what to do. Mm. I never had anyone. So I had to go through a lot to be able to tie an hook to be able to put a float on. In fact, I was such a novice. When I first used a spinner, I used to put it under a float, you know. Go on, the floating and, spinner. You know, and that's sort of, I didn't have a clue really. So I never really got taught anything. So I think I had to go a lot deeper yeah. into it to learn how to actually catch fish. And um, and that was that really for my small fishing. And I, then I got into um, my roach fishing and my perch fishing at the all the lakes in Epping Forest, Right. Uh, as I got a little bit older, then I could travel a bit further and I started to fish uh, Wanstead Park in Epping Forest, um, in one of the Epping Forest lakes, Eagle Ponds as well, and Whips Cross Hollow Ponds in um, in East London. So I started to fish them as well, float fishing, and I started catching bigger fish. I caught my first tench uh, from Wanstead Park. And it was there where I saw um, an angler who's still carp fishing nowadays, um, and I still speak to him, a guy called Ron Wood. Um, mm-hmm. and, um, Ron, Ron was old school carp angler, you know, he's older than me, Ron. And, you know, we all used to look up to him cause he was one of the first guys that I ever see with like a, a bivy and a, and a free rod set up, which in them days was heron, herons and glass yeah. fiber rods, you know, and, and cardinal reels. So we looked up to him being really small and I see him catch an eight pounder from Wanstead Park, which was a tough lake. It wasn't an easy lake at all. It was a really tough lake. It wasn't that mini carp around. And he caught an eight pounder. And that day I was born a carp angler because me and me mate, we were standing there. And literally that night we went home all the way on the bus talking about how we're going to catch our first carp. And it's, you know, cause that eight pounder just blew us away. Yeah. It was massive. It was absolutely massive. So, and it was dark bronze fish. It was an amazing common. And from then on, my ledger rod, I had a ledger rod and I cut the tip off. I cut the tip off the ledger rod and I took it down my local tackle shop and they glued an, an, um, a tip high on. Yeah. So it was more sturdy. So it could handle an heavier lead and a carp. And that's, that was my first carp rod. It was just a cut down ledger rod. 
And um, I'd have that on and I had a float rod as well. So they were my carp rods, you know. Uh, we had a cut down float rod. Um, my mate was the same. He cut his rods down as well, Tony, who I fish with. And um, we, our first carp bait was um, was a floating cake, what Tony's mum made, you know. And because them days you couldn't buy carp baits. No. You didn't know what to buy. But we'd um, someone told us a recipe at the lake and that's what we used. We we made our own floating cakes and we used to use a curtain ring and we used to put the hook through a curtain ring and then you used to put a big massive lump of floating cake on, like, you know, a good sort of couple of inches thick, really thick, cast it out and then you'd let the line up and the line would pull through the curtain ring. Oh, right. And then you'd fix it to the surface and then if the ducks come along, you could pull it just under the surface. <laughs> so if the ducks come, they couldn't get it. And that's how that's how we first started fishing. But I never caught a thing doing that. Never no? caught a single fish um, blanked. It wasn't until um, a bit later that I caught my first carp. In fact, my first carp, was I had to go, f- I had to work quite hard to get my first fish. Talk us through that first fish then, mate, while we're here. Well, I, I, um, I'd been blanking because I, I was totally clueless, um, and but I was learning all the time. And who, then, who were you learning off? You said that you got your mate with you. Yeah, I, I was learning off. Prominent. I was learning off my mate, but also in Robertson's fishing tackle. What, what I was talking about earlier in in um, in Plasto, there was a guy there called Bob who still works there now, and he he had one of the first bait companies around, which was called Universal Bait Bait Flavors and Ingredients. So there was these ingredients for sale and they were like little clear bags, I remember, and you could buy soya flour, like soya isolate, calcium cassonate, you know, um, sodium cassonate. And and we started to mix these ingredients together with baking powder Mm. and then baking them in ovens and stuff. And then we started to use them as a paste. But what I found was when I put the paste out, it just disintegrate on the yuk. So it wasn't staying on the yuk for, for no longer than an hour at a time. So then I started to learn that I could put wheat gluten, which made it like rubbery. And then the paste would last for four or five hours. Um, and then eventually started boiling the paste and, and come to boilies. But my first ever carp was caught from a lake in Essex called Warren, um, it was at Warwick Lane. And it was a, um, a small lake but it had quite a few commons in it. Like uh, In them days, they were small commons, but they were big for us. Yeah. And a friend of mine called Paul Warner, he took me down there as a guest. I think his dad was a member, and he was a member as well, and he took me for a guest. And I was only about, I don't know, probably 11 or 12, and I had me cut down rods, and he took me over there a couple of times, and that's where I caught my first carp out of there. And um, it was £8, 4 ounce. I remember it clearly. I caught it on a side hook Paternoster rig, so it was side hook pattern oster. It would have been a Jack Hilton carp hook. That's what I was using at the yeah. time, Jack Hilton carp hooks. And um, it was on a shrimp flavoured paste bait, which I'd got all the ingredients from Bob uh, um, Robertson's tackle and the shrimp. I always remember the shrimp flavour. It was really thick, super thick. And you had to get, sort of get it out of a little spoon and scoop it out. It was, you know, but yeah, um, rich. Yeah, it was, but it was a really good, it was a good bait. And that's what we caught. And I, I think I caught three or four fish from Warwick Lane while I was going over there with Paul, um, using the pattern oster and, and stuff. And and so it all developed from there, really. And then I think a big breakthrough for me, because once it was a bit too hard, I did. I eventually caught all the fish from once did, and I had the big one out of there three times. Eventually. Of course you did. But um, at the time, it was a little bit a step too far for yeah. me. It was quite low stock, and I did struggle. And um, I sort of started fishing a lake not too far from here called Lake Meadows in Billericay. Yeah, yeah. And it was a train journey. Um, a f- my mate in school, Tony, his sister lived just up the road, um, you know, and her husband. Um, they'd lived just up the road. And they had a, they were young, they were a young family. And a couple of times, we, me and Tony went and stayed there and we used to float fish Lake Meadows. And it used to be brilliant float fishing. Like you could feel you keeping it up with sort of gudgeon, roach, perch, you know, big perch. All sorts. And we used to see the carp anglers there with their bivvies, you know. And, and again, it was another thing that was sort of pushing us towards our carp fishing. And that was the lake I caught my first double from, Lake oh, yeah. Meadows. Yeah, so once we started getting that carp bug, we started me and sort of four or five other youngsters from East London, Danny Gill, who's not alive now, Danny, a good mate of mine, um, Tony. Um, and it was, yeah, it was four or five of us. And we used to drive up, we used to, Get a, get a lift to Stratford Station and then jump on a train from Stratford Station every weekend to Billericay 
and walk with our trolleys because in days you know you didn't have barrels we had shopping trolleys so you, you save you like your your mum's shopping trolley or in my case it was me nan's and you used to strap all your gear to the shopping trolleys and all your buckets and everything all your particles and, and that and, and we used to drag it all the way up to Billericay every weekend and in the summer holidays I used to spend the whole summer there and that's where I learned how to use hair rigs you know tiger nuts peanuts all these sort of is that just off the other anglers that you've seen yeah yeah there's yeah. some really there's some anglers there that you know they're older than us we were, I was still young at the time and, and you know they was in the early development stages you know people you know people there was a lot of well known anglers who fish mm. Lake Meadows people like Jimmy Burns um, you know, Lee Jackson, people like that had fished Lee um, around that time. You know, Punky John, he was on there at the time. John, Johnny Smith, you know, there was a lot of um, a lot of a lot of well known good anglers, yeah. sort of from that era, who fished uh, the Essex Lakes, and that's how I learned all sort of all the stuff that I I done. You know, baiting up, and you know, we uh, my hair rigs, my rigs. You know the different, all the little tricks of the trade because we, all, you know, you get to know everyone and and you learn and and then my baits were getting better. I was learning more about how, how to keep them making the baits last longer on the hook and stuff like that. And that's you know, a lot of a lot of sort of self led development in terms of thinking about stuff, engineering type in terms of bait. There's a lot of information you need to glean there and know about to to make it successful and and led to your captures. That sort of mindset. I'd imagine if harnessed in whatever it is that you do would be successful because you wanted it, you wanted to catch carp. So you, you drive was really sort of big in terms of you and school and that sort of formal engineering education scenario. What was, what was that relationship like? Were you good at school? Did you enjoy it or? I struggled at school. Um, did you? Yeah, I did. I really struggled at school. I couldn't get my head around it from, from um, when I first went to um, primary school I couldn't really get my head around school from day one. Um, I didn't really like school at all. I liked the sport. I was really into my sport. I used to, I played football for my district team yeah. and stuff, you know, and I've played I played football quite a higher level. Um so I was really into my sport, but um I hate education. I didn't so. like school. I just couldn't get my head around what they were trying to teach me and why they were trying to teach it to me. So when uh, it was a bit of a different era to now, I mean, I've got children, and you know, they'd be horrified if they if they sort of lived how I lived around that sort of time. But mm. I must have been about thirteen when I never went to school again. Um, so you sacked off school at thirteen? Yeah, thirteen, fourteen. I right. never, I never went, I never went to school after that. I mean, my my attendance weren't great anyway because um, I used to, I I lived with my nan at the time, and I used to get on the wrong bus every morning, and it used to go to the lake instead of the school. <laughs> so my attendance wasn't great. And once I got into my carp fishing, like especially when I was about fourteen, fifteen, when I really knew what I was doing and I was starting to catch big fish. I mean, um, then I really didn't want to go to school, and um, and I think in the end it just sort of broke away from me, and I didn't, you know. Did you ever have um, a thought that you? sort of job wise of what you do or was it all just about the fishing um i, I never really had a thought much thought about of a, uh, a job i i did start getting in fact my first job was when i was 15 what i used to do was work in the close season in the winters yeah so my first my, i started to work on the building sites in london um you know there was a lot of at the time there was a lot of building going on in london sort of mid 80s sort of early mid 80s and um, I used to get jobs labouring through the winter with all the Irish on the concrete labouring and stuff like that which was really hard work mm -hmm. um, but it used to pay good and um, so and I used to save all my money up through the so through the winter and the spring and then I'd save a few hundred pound up you know to pay for all my bait and that and then I'd fish all summer that's what I used to do so I, I did I, I was interested in work but I was more interested in fishing. So yeah. I just wanted enough money to keep me on the bank. It's a pretty similar story with everyone, even, even Kev here. Like obviously it was all geared towards creating enough income for you to go fishing and enjoy it. So yeah, I can see that mindset, but in terms of your engineering and you being able to sort of develop baits, everything, teach yourself essentially, that is impressive, mate. Cause it wasn't a time that was particularly 
sort of advanced. If you came up now, there's plenty of YouTube videos. There's plenty of stuff to learn from. Back then, it was real sort of formative stuff, mate. Well, we didn't really know what we was doing, and a lot of it was trial and error. Yeah. So we were doing a lot of stuff where... Um, you know, that didn't work as well as we done stuff that did work. We also done a lot of stuff that didn't work that we would have forgot about. But I think one of my major, um, my, a major breakthrough for me and what caught me a lot of fish was the way that I tied my hair rigs. Um, because what I, what happened was I started to use um, Orleon Dior hooks and Orleon Dior hooks in those days, they were cheap. They were like two quid for a hundred. Wow. Yeah, two quid for a hundred. And you could buy them in separates in one shop. You know, you could literally buy a single hook. Okay. So, which is a bit odd. You know, like you people used to buy a separate fag, didn't they? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, they used to. You've got to be old to remember that. When I was a kid, <laughs> if you wanted a fag, you go and buy a separate for 10p, you know. You couldn't afford a buck. So, it was a bit like that. But anyway, all the on Dior hooks, they came in two different sizes. You had the two, four, six, eight, which are pretty much the English sizes, um, but they were eyed. But then you also had um, some odd numbers, like fives. I think it was the fives I used to use, and they were spade end. And they had a thicker gauge. They had a thicker wire on them. Um, they had a much thicker wire, and and they were stronger. And I started to use those. But what it meant was I had to whip my hooks, whip on, uh, whip whip my Dacron, because in them days we was using Dacron, yeah. you know, soft hook links. So I'd have to do a whipping knot. Now, what we used to do, we used to tie the two-pan line off the bend of the hook, yeah? Yeah. So by doing that, because when you whip a hook on, if you put the hook, the eye, the line coming out the sort of bend of the hook angle, you get that kick that yeah. we all look for now. Yeah. So what happened was this using spade end hooks naturally gave you the kick. Yeah. So the kick came natural. So we 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 bin the idea of tying two pan line on the bend of the yoke, which was the original hair, which like hmm. Lenny Middleton and Maddox sort of first, you know, they are publicised or well, Maddox publicised, but Lenny Middleton come up with. Yeah. And what we done is we just started. It's been lazy, really. It was just like the tag end of the Dacron. Instead of tying another hair, it's like oh god, just tie that, tie a knot in that. And chuck you boily on that, and it just the catches just started going through the roof after that. I what an think, edge, mate! Yeah, it was a good edge, and I always remember one of my mates. He 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 see what we were doing, and he'd done the same, but he took his the line out the back of the hook, yeah, 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 yeah. and so he didn't get that kick, and we knew straight away, no, no, you don't do it like that, you know, turn it round, get that kick, and I think that that was a big edge as well as the baits we were using and the time. I mean. Time is the biggest edge of all in carp fishing. And once you know, I mean, I, when I fished Hainault Forest in Essex, Hainault Forest was a super hard lake, um, really was. It didn't have many fish. There was only sort of nine mirrors in there that we knew of um, when I first fished there. And it was really hard until about 87 when they stocked it. But pre-87, it was really, really low stock. Um, but it was the time that we had that we we had the massive edge over everyone in them days because we never had no responsibilities. I wasn't going to school. I was living with my nan. That's you know, an amazing time. I mate. didn't. Um, you know, it was too. Hainault Forest was two bus rides from my house. So the time having that sort of amount of time having them rigs access to the tackle that we had. Um, which wasn't a lot. It was basic, like all the on Dior um, spade ends that had come over from France. You couldn't even buy them in this country. Uh, we got, I, I got those. I think it was um, a couple of the guys. This was right at the start of Lac Cassien, right when the, when the boys first went to Lac Cassien, and then a couple of the lads um, who were fishing ain't all the time had been to Lac Cassien. Uh, Max Cottis, yeah, Max Cottis, and Peter Ridley, yeah, and they'd been out there, and they had. These all on Dior's, and that's I think that's who I got them off of. I think I got them off Max. Really? Yeah. It seems like, I mean, yeah, unbelievable times in terms of you're a kid, you're just pursuing your passion, you've got that freedom, you've got that time, and you're learning, and you've also got a real good sort of development circle around other anglers. They're very keen to sort of share stuff with you by the sounds of it, like which is all part of the scene, if you like, at that point, it seems like everyone was quite friendly, weren't they? Was there anybody yeah. who didn't like you uh, pestering them? They weren't friendly at all. Um, were they not? Yeah, there were some anglers who were friendly, but a lot of the anglers there, especially where we were young, they weren't friendly at all. 
I mean, when I fished Anal Forest, uh, when I started, I mean, I got to know everyone over there and they all end up my good mates and they are too today. But when we first started over there, there was a few of the old school over there who really would turn your back or turn turn their back on you and not speak to you. So it wasn't generally like that. But, you know, we, we were always trying for information and we were learning a lot of the information ourselves. Also, at the time, it was the start of the Carp Society. Mm. It was very early in the Carp Society. And the Carp Society used to run... Um, run do do nights at uh, um a pub near me, the Duke's Head in East Ham. And what used to happen, some of the top hangers of the day, who would have been like Rod Hutchinson, Roger Smith, right. Bob yeah. Jones, they used to come down there, Richie was there, they used to come down there and do a talk, do a slideshow. So when I was I, I never miss one of them. That's yeah. how keen I was. Yeah. I was super keen. And I'd be there, I'd be the first one on the front row trying to find out because we're kids. You know, so you're really super keen. So, and because there wasn't many young carp anglers around then, there was a few, but there weren't many. Like now, there's a lot of young carpers around. Yeah, there's a lot more information. But then, every all fishermen were pleasure anglers. They were float anglers. There was, you know, and nowadays we haven't really got that float sort of. Yeah, yeah, I like, see what you mean. Like when I was a kid, the park lakes were full. Every swim was a kid with a float rod, mm. especially in the summer holidays. We don't have that no more. No, right? no. A lot of people go straight into carping, don't they? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Let's take Hainault Forest, as we talked about. You've sort of alluded to there as a, as a, it's a definitely a significant chapter. Um, what year did you first go on to Hainault? And talk to me about your time on there, mate. Well, I, I originally, my first ever time I fished Hainault was with my mum, and I was about nine. And my mum took me over there, fishing over there, and I was float fishing, and I was so young, I didn't even know how to put the maggots on. And my mum would, so I, it was at East, it was just on the outskirts of East London, so it was pretty local to me. So that would have been the first time, but I didn't ever go over there as a carp angler until 84. And it was a funny story, because we were fishing Wanstee Park at the time, which had a big fish in it, which was a 26, which was a big fish there. Yeah, very, very big fish. I'd caught it that season at 25, 8. I think. Um, wow. Was that your first 20? It was my first 20, that fish, Ooh. yeah. Um, I'd caught it at 25, 8. Anyway, that we met two guys who were walking around. And I remember one of them, his name was Sid, and he was a dustman. And they both, uh, the other one, I can't remember his name now, but they were friends of Vic Cranfield. Now, Vic Cranfield, he used to run the Carp Society in the old days. Now, they they were dustmen. And what happened was uh, they said to us, we're going to go and do the first week of the season on Anal Forest. This was in 1984. And, um, but they'd never caught a carp before. But this is, a, this is a true story anyway. Sid, who was a dustman at my house, and also um, I used to met him at Wanted Park, he'd cast out first week of the season a massive bit of floating crust mm. on Anal Forest, anchored it out in the middle and sat there all week watching it with binoculars. <laughs> Yeah, and this is the sort of fishing that people would do yeah. in them days. So he's got this massive bit of crust. He's anchored it right out in the middle, and he's sat there all week watching it with binoculars. First week of the season. That's his week. Wow. So this is the sort of things. Anyway, this is a true story. Halfway through the week, he said it's it looked like a spare tyre come up from the bottom, sucked in his giant bit of crust, and run off with it. Yeah? <laughs> So anyway, cut a long story short, Sid caught the big girl, 35 and a half. Oh, that is massive. Which is a monster. And so when he come back and told us this, me and a couple of my mates, because they were as green as the gr- as grass, we, 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 you know, we wasn't. We, 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 we looked at each other and went, right, that's our next port of call. Yeah. So that close season, the following close season, we started baiting it up. Me and a mate would get a bus over there every week and and I'd put a ten ounce mix out. Ten ounce, what what are you putting out, mate? Well, what we I'll tell you what the bait was, and yeah. and, and this is it was um it was a milk protein. It would have been based on sort of caseins, uh, calcium casinate, lactalbumin. I think that year we was using um I think what's it called um it might have even been a soya protein we was using. There was a bit of soya protein in there. It was a mixed bait. It was a, it was a high, quite a high protein bait. Um, would have been a little bit of soya flour in there as well, I reckon, at the time. Um, but I didn't have a flavouring in it. I you wasn't didn't have a no, flavour in it. No, we we were told the Hainault fish had seen everything, right. you know, because it was a it was a well known lake, and all the top anglers have fished it, you know, from sort of Kent and Essex, 
and they'd seen everything. So our mind thinking, they're not going to like flavours. They're going to be too advanced, these carp, yeah. to actually like flavourings. They'll know it's bait and leave it. Because in when I first started making bait, it was a saying around me, some of the carp hangs would say, if you can smell it, it's got too much in it. Mm. Yeah, which is totally different to what we have today. Yeah. Yeah, so it was if you can smell it, it's got too much in it because the carp sense of smell is so much better than ours. So we were baiting with um, with these ingredients. What would I have been using? I think I was putting vitamins in it. I was think I was putting vitamin supplements. Okay. I was loading it with vitamin supplements and um, thinking that the vitamin supplements, all the trace minerals, would attract the fish. So that's that's that was our thought behind that. Anyway, uh, we baited up all close season, and then we started fishing it. Um, it was it, the lake had such a reputation, not just being rock hard, yeah. Also for being a park lake, loads of fish nicking. Um, sorry, loads of tackle thieving. Ta- oh, tackle thief. tackle thieving, and also fish nicking as well. I you mean, said there's only seven. Is there seven fish in there at this time? I seven think there fish. was nine, nine mirrors in there and some commons. But all of them fish got put in from other lakes. Did they? So it was in one of these sort of, it was in the era when fish got moved. Yeah. Uh, the big one, they said, had come from Kent. Someone had driven it across from Kent <laughs> and it would have been a Sutton fish. So it would have been wow. sort of the cousin of Basil yeah. that ended up in Yateley. And this is how a lot of it started. So how big was Haynot, mate, in terms like, of acreage? Six acres. Six acres. Only small. But, but Still. Big enough in them days. Um, yeah, so... The, the tackle thieving was really bad. Oh, the first night we ever done over there, we were so scared. We tied booby traps all round our swim. And I think the first two, three times I fished Hainault Forest, my swim was just booby trapped everywhere. What sort of booby traps? Uh, so got? we'd be putting line up with saucepans hanging off of them that are going to bang together. Um, you know, we'd fish all, two or three of us have all fished together because yeah. we were expecting one o'clock in the morning, a little gang to come and take our gear. Yeah. Because that, that's what was going on in them days. But funny enough, I, 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 you know, we didn't have them problems until a bit later. Um, I caught the big girl, I caught, it was my third fish. Talk us through that capture then, mate. That was, that was my third fish. Um, I'd done a, I'd done a couple of weeks on there, like week sessions and it, it was rock hard, you know? And, um, I think it was my second week session that I'd done that I caught my first carp out of there, which was a common about nine pounds, which I was over the moon with. And, um, I think it was my third session. I went over there and it was, I always remember it was a real strong southwesterly that week. Low pressure, perfect, absolutely perfect conditions. And the fish had been jumping all week out in the middle. And, and they didn't show well, the, the Hainault fish. Um, but this week they did. They were jumping. You could hear them at night. In the morning you'd see one coming out. The conditions were so spot on. And there there'd been there was a guy fishing in this particular swim where had the fish in front of it. And he'd been there for about two weeks. And he blanked and he moved and I moved in after him and um, I moved right in where he was. Anyway, my bait had been, I'd been on the bank for about seven days and my bait had all gone mouldy. Right. Um, I, my bait was pure white. It was mouldy. But in those days, we knew that that was enzyme active. We knew that that was in a good condition. Mm. And, and I always remember putting a stringer. A six in those it was when it was the first days that PVA come out, and it was it, you know it was like oh it was it was weird stuff. It, it's not like the PVA you got nowadays. It was like you know it was like this stringy sort of plastic. It was a weird gear. Anyway, I've put about a four or five bait stringer out of these mouldy baits out where these fish have been showing. I spread my other two rods, and um, about one o'clock in the afternoon, I was sitting in my mate swim next door. It was only like twenty yards up the bank. What had happened is my sleeping bag had fell on my sounder box. So in those days, we was using optonics and you had a sounder box. So sleeping bag fell on a sounder box and someone had heard my buzzer going and they walked past my rods and they shouted out, tell, and I run up there and I started playing this fish and the lake was packed out and I knew straight away it weren't one of the little commons because it was pulling hard. And um, I had him on for about 25, 30 minutes, this fish. And it was really, it was going through loads of other lines. Um, you know, it took me right down one end of the lake. It was a, it was an epic battle. And when we see it rolling close, we just see this big mirror. 
And you knew with Hainal, it was the mirrors we were after. Mm. The commons were all small. I think they, they, there was one in there. It was around 19, 20 pound at the time. But the commons were pretty small. So you might be lucky to get a double. But the mirrors were all 18 pound plus. So they were all big fish. Um, anyway, I got this mirror in the net. We looked. It was big fish. We knew it was big and as we lifted it out, it was getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> and at the time, I was using Avon scales, um, which, you know, they, they were scales to be used. But they only went up to 32, I think 32.8 or something like that. And I put it on the scales and it just busted them, just no. flattened them out. And it was then that we realised the fish we had, that we'd had the one that Sid had caught, that had come up and took, the, you know, his crust the, follow, the year before. What year is this then, mate? 85. Eight, that is the year I was born, Eight, and that's a 30-pounder. Yeah, 36 and a half. Oh, my yeah. days. That's massive. Big scaly fish and all it was. Absolute stunner. Beautiful. Did you get some other scales then? Did somebody else? Yeah, I'll tell you what. We, 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 um, we put two scales back to back. Yeah. yeah, we put two scales back to back and we weighed it on that. But someone, um, Max Cottis, lived a couple of miles along the road and Kipper George and someone on the lake knew where they lived and someone drove to, to make sure that we weighed this fish properly. Yeah. Someone drove around Max's house and got his salters because that was the year he caught his uh, big casein fish. So that would have been that same year. So yeah, um, I think Max turned up. I helped us weigh and photograph it, and that was it, 36 and a half. And how old are you? I was 15 at the time. 15, yeah. and you've caught, there 15. couldn't have been many 30 pounders about. No, nah, no, nah, there wasn't. Um, That's madness, mate. It's ridiculous. Yeah, there's probably more 30s now in some of the lakes than there was in the old country. Yeah. Uh, easily. So, yeah, that was it. But, you know, I was on such a high, I didn't really know what I'd caught yeah. because it was such a massive fish. I didn't know how to accept it or what. Um, but the following day, I come down to a massive crash because I got all my tackle stolen. No. Yeah. I don't know if it was uh, one of the anglers who was jealous or maybe, you know, there was a bit of tackle stealing, but I was, um, I'd left my rods. So, you know, I weren't in my swim. I was in another swim, you know, having a social like we did at Hainal. And mm. that was, it was a very social lake. And uh, when I come back, yeah, I had, um, my reels had gone. Oh, Mitchell 300s, I think they was. And um, I had some um, optonics that, Cottis had converted for me. He'd um he'd converted them for me and they had sort of little speakers on the front of them and I'd lost them and all. Swiped them nightmare. Mm. Yeah, so you never find out who did it, no? No, no. No. We had a rough idea. There was a guy who used to turn up every now and then in the summer and fish, and it was after about two or three years that we realised that every night he fished, someone had their gear nicked. Mm. So we reckon he used to just kick, sit and fish and watch who was asleep and then just whip their gear off, go and hide it in the forest. Yes, that's And then it. collect it the next day. So, yeah, it went on quite a bit. In terms of your time on there, so you've caught the big one. Did you stay on there after the big one? Yeah, well, um, obviously... You know, there weren't that many big fish around in them days. So yeah. once I caught that fish, then my target was the next big one in there. There was another 30 in there as well, which was a 32 pounder, which was a real stunning fish, a real like chestnut sort of dark chestnut fish, mm. um, real powerful, big shoulders, you know, real long. Um, yeah. And I wanted to stay off the rim and there was a few twenties in there and all, and you know, twenties were hard to come by in them days. Mm. And especially it was so local. I think it was only five miles from my house and it was two bus rides. So, you know, it was free fishing and all. It wasn't, you didn't have to buy a oh. ticket. It was free fishing. It was just the, you know, it was just the park lake. Yeah. Pretty much on the outskirts of London. So I went back for the other 30 and uh, I caught that in 1986. No, well, a couple of years later. Following season. Yeah. So it was only my second season. So my first season I caught the big one and I caught the third biggest one in there as well and the fourth which would have been a fish that we called Eldridge, which was named after a guy called Jimmy Eldridge. Um, I caught that at 26.10. But that was, a, that was a big breakthrough for me, catching that one. Why is that? Um, because of the way... Because Hainault was really, really tough, and I was really struggling over there, you know. Even though I'd caught the big one, I'd caught a couple of other small commons. Um, I'd caught a fish that had been put in there, which we ended up calling the fairlock fish, the flop fish. But it was only a small mirror. I'd caught that a couple of times. But I, I struggled, really did struggle. And um, one day I was over there and, um, you know, I, I had I hooked a duck 
off the top, yeah, because right. I, I float fished over there and all. In those days, we used to use candles as controllers. Yeah, yeah. And you could get them miles out in the middle, like, you know. So I never caught a single fish out of anal off the top, but I used to fish it a lot off the top, and, and it was hard. Anyway, I fish him one day, and his ducks took me, and he's took me through the island. And a couple of the people around the park are like, oh, no, you've done what you've done to the duck. And I felt bad. And it was <laughs> such a hot day, and there was no one around. So I swam out to the island to free the duck, yeah, and to get me candle back. So while I was out there, I thought, you know what? I'm going to have a good mooch around the lake because there was no one around. And I started to walk all over the lake um, feeling for spots with my feet. So all of a sudden, because it was quite shallow, it was up to my shoulders sort of thing, right. up to my chest. And all of a sudden, I'd feel this deep silt, really deep silt around my ankles and it'd go right deep down. And then all of a sudden, I'd go to this sort of hard clay bit and then there'd be a bit that's a bit more raised. And then there was... Be- so I'm starting to find all these crevices. And anyway, I found a little raised bit. It was probably the size of sort of like a 30, 40 inch brolly. Um, you know, not massive. Um, it was small enough. It was small. It was big enough probably to get three rods tight in on against. But what I've done is I marked it up um, with a seagull. With now, a seagull? I went and got a load of... Because it, it was in a park, yeah? And yeah. there was loads of polystyrene everywhere yeah so because everyone's drinking their polystyrene teas and stuff like this and milkshakes and what I've done is I got a lump of polystyrene and I got a polystyrene cup and sewed it with some line onto the top and mate and drew on it so it looked like a seagull so I sort of carved this bit of polystyrene into a seagull yeah what a marker that is yeah and what I've done is I, I sent it out just past me spot um with some light line and I, in the old days, you had hot dog tins, and that's what we used to live on at the bank, hot dogs. And you used to have a little cat, um, like a little lid that yeah. you could lift up. So I tied my line on that, pushed the hot dog tin into the deep silt on the back of my spot, and then this little seagull's out there in the middle of the... He's floating around, around out in a little lake. So what I'd done is I went home, went and got some money, went down to... I couldn't afford... I mean, my boilies at the time were low. I, I couldn't afford many boilies, you know. A 10-ounce mix had to last me a good couple of weeks, you know, because yeah. it's so expensive in those days, ingredients and boilies. Um, but my bait was peanuts. I went and bought a big bucket of peanuts, big bucket, um, left them in soak, in, and we used to soak them in milk. Um, yeah. yeah so- I remember you saying this to me, yeah. Yeah, soaked them in milk, um, cooked them, a little bit, you know, at home. And then I had a big bucket. And what I'd done is I went and put that whole bucket on, I swam out. I got there. It was dark. It was, it was cold. It was a cozy, it's in October and all. It was start of October and there was a cold wind um, blowing. And I remember it was absolutely freezing. There was only one other person on the lake and it was just getting dark. And I stripped off to me pants and a dirty old pair of trainers in case there was any rusty bolts on the bottom or anything. Mm. And I waded out to me spot. And tip me bucket of peanuts down. Absolutely frozen. Just mate. before me um me seagull. I tip me bucket of peanuts down. And then I come back. I always remember this. I come back and I was so confident that this was gonna be the breakthrough because this spot was a lot harder than everywhere else. It just it just felt right. So what when I come back, I got I got all my bits together and it was just too dark to get my rods back out there. So what I've done is each rod in pretty much in the dark, I waded each rod out to the spot and dropped it, <laughs> chucked it right. Just short of me marker on the spot. Get no word of a lie. By the next morning, all three rods had gone. Wow. All three rods had gone. I'd lost the fish. Funny enough. I, had two of my rods was on three pound lime rig. This was at the time What's when the three pound line, three pound line rig was quite big. Everyone, people were using it, and a friend of mine, Kim, had caught the big one out of there using the three pound line rig. And what it is, the three pound line rig is a length of three pound line, which is your hook link, right? But then you'd use a bit of catapult elastic as a um, as a shock absorber, right? So then you'd have three pound line shock absorber, then you'd have a bead, then your lead, like, and obviously with your swivel in in place. So I'd hook two carp on this three pan line rig, lost a pair of them. Mm. One of them's took me, when I've woke up in the morning, I'm, I'm into this fish about one o'clock in the morning over these peanuts, yeah? And they must have just got right on them straight away. And this fish has took my seagull marker right up the other end of the lake. <laughs> so it's kited off with yeah. the seagull marker. In the end, it's done me three pan line. Another fish had took gone right, and there used to be a post, the old post, 
and it took me round the post, oh. and I lost that one. And I eventually got a little common in about eight pounds yeah. um, on my rod that had that crown on. And so I was over the moon. Even though I'd lost these fish, I'd had my best night's fishing ever on anal. Yeah. Uh, anyway, cut a long story short, after that, I never use a three pound line rig again. Um, every rod went out that night, casted with that cron. I waded back out there, got me marker back from up the other end, put the marker back where it was, put a lot, another bed of peanuts down, and I think that week I took seven fish, wow. including Eldridge at 26.10, which was a big fish for me then. Yeah. And I was still only 15. That's good angling, mate. Yeah. Before that, preceding this, you've, you obviously said that you felt around, you felt that hard spot. When you caught the big one, were you spot fishing in terms of like looking at, were you just seeing fish and casting into the middle or did you have any sort of sense around what your actual lead arrangement, everything was landing on? Yeah, we were looking for spots. So what we would do, um, we were areas that are less silty. Right. So you yeah. were actually looking so, for So yeah, we was, we, we would be casting in and I was, I remember using long hook links on anal forest because of the silt. What are we talking, silt. how long? I reckon like two foot. Yeah. Two foot hook links I was using, 18 inches, two foot. Um, and what I would do is I'd just get in a swim, have a cast and just keep pulling back and just see if you can find where it isn't so, so tough. But what I did find out later is that the clay spots would really bend your rod. So if you lead landed in clay, which were the harder bits, you'd get a real good bend on the rod. But then as soon as it pulled out, it'd be like glass. So yeah. We started to learn like that, but but this spot that I'd found out in the middle, and I think where I'd concentrated the peanuts out there, because at the time, some of the boys could get a spot out there. This was the days of the early spots yeah. where people were making them out of beer cans and yeah. stuff like that, yeah. But um, I, I didn't have the right tackle. I didn't have a beach caster, so it was pretty much swimming for me. And um, and But fishing on a tight area out right in the middle – using peanuts, which were a great bait, obviously worked and, and it done me done me proud. And I think the following trip I took another twenty and all. I had the friendly at twenty pounds something. So over that period up to November, I'd I'd took a good I took a proportion of the stock just just doing that. That's amazing angling. What was it like in terms of you catching them being so young and the rest of the anglers on there? Were they all right with you generally or I think I'd already had a bit of a reputation by then because I'd caught from other lakes and all local lakes so right. I had a bit of a reputation so I think they pretty much knew who I was um, you know so that was that but the following year I went back with exactly the same method um, to catch these other 30 and this time I had a bit more money because I've been a work all winter in the close yeah. season and I'd been labouring and um, up London you know really <laughs> pulling me <laughs> pulling myself out so and um, what I'd done is I started swimming tiger nuts because tiger nuts were more expensive than peanuts. And I used to buy my tigers out of a health food shop in um, in Gants Hill. And the guy in there didn't like anglers. Um, he was anti-fishing. So we right. used to have to go, get people to go in there for us. And because he knew us, because we'd go in there and we'd say, how many tigers you got? He'd say, like, I've got these. And we'd just buy the whole lot because it, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it was a health food, you know. Um, so we, I started to put swim tigers out to these spots and that's how I caught my second 30 that was in 86 I think uh in July I had a bucket of tigers I'd swum a bucket of tigers out to a spot just off the island a silty area which was a little bit less silt than the other bits and um a bucket I took tipped a whole bucket of tigers and that's and I started fishing that spot and that's how I caught my second 30 tiger on the hair dacron no, same no no right. it was used boilies over the top Oh, right. didn't use on we didn't use the tigers or that on we always said that the tigers if you use the tigers on the air you get the little commons and if you use the boilies you get the bigger fish right so I used to bait with the tigers and then I'd have my little 10 ounce mix of boilies which I'd fish on each rod and then just a few boilies out there okay. but the tigers was the bulk bait to get all the fish in you know yeah. and um and yeah and I caught um and that was a that was a brilliant catcher catching that because um, it was at the start of the six week holidays and I really wanted to, to get off there quick because I'd already left school by then. I was 16 and I just started to sign on. Right. I was getting my first ever gyro Yeah, because I'd officially left school and I wanted to fish all summer and then I was going to work in the winter like I did. And um, I always remember when the school se- school holidays start, we knew all the kids would turn up. So I, busy. I, I really wanted to catch that fish before the school holidays started. And it was the first day of the school holidays and I could see... A, a fish boiling up on my spot out in the middle all day 
And um, I think I even had tigers on the rods at the time, and and I changed over to some boilies. I think I made a I made a two egg mix because I made all my bait at the bank. Yeah. So I used to just take my powder with me, a couple of eggs and a little bottle of flavour and my little mixing bowl. And I think I made a little two or three egg mix of um, of boilies. And because and this fish had been feeding on me all day, I sort of changed what I was doing. And I reeled one of my rods in and chucked a boilie out there onto the spot that I was fishing. So this was casting, not wading out and dropping? No, yeah. I'd wade my bait out and I'd cast yeah, okay. on my spot because I had markers out there. Yeah. I mean, this is reversing a bit, but... My, my seagull marker got sussed out by the local park keepers and they made me take it out the lake. Right. They didn't want it in the lake. And this is a funny story. The following week, we went to a shooting shop and we bought a decoy duck and we stuck a decoy duck out on our spot and it just used to sit out there spinning around and you see all the bird watchers sitting there with the binoculars watching it like, you know. <laughs> and um, But I, where I caught the 30 was not in the open water. It was off the island where you could see where you was baiting anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But catching that was a brilliant feeling because I really wanted that fish. The, the big one come out a surprise. I, I didn't really deserve the big one. It was the third fish out of there. But this fish I deserved because I'd gone, I'd got, I'd already had half the stock and, um, or most of the stock and what a fish that was. And I remember netting it and not having a camera at the time. And there was a couple of kids fishing a bit further up and these two kids walked up and um, they see me with a fish and everything and they was blown away. And I said to them, look, I said, help me. You know, you're going to have yeah. to help me. Here. Yeah. Um, so we got the fish in the sack and they stood with a sack and it was literally, because it was a park, it was like, give them a big stick. Anyone comes along, do not let them near that sack, whatever you do. <laughs> Like that sack is just, yeah. you know, you your life Defend won't be it worth... with your life. Yeah, because they're only kids and your yeah. life ain't worth living if that sack goes anywhere. And I've run all the way to Paul Stapley's house in in Hainal, in Hainal, who lived in Hainal, right in the sort of state. And I knocked on his door and I always remember he had an Olympus trip, which was a good camera, 35 mil. And he, he come and done it. It was 32 pounds, something. So your first two 30s from Hainal? Yeah, yeah. from Hainal Forest, yeah. This is 86 is your last one. That is that is amazing, mate. Yeah. And so pretty much from then, I was red carded from Hainault. Um, but you red carded yourself? I red carded myself because some of my mates were fishing on there still, especially Tony, who, who I started carping with, and he, he wanted to catch the 30s out there. So it was a case of, you know, you, I don't want to catch these fish again and make a mockery of my first capture, it's time to move on. And yeah, so for those that might not know, red carded means that you're not going back and fishing it again. That is it. You are done. Your time on there is is done. To be fair, mate, you've caught everything you need to, haven't you, mate? Yeah, so, and the well was my oyster. And also by fishing uh, Hainal Forest, I'd, I'd met a lot of good anglers mm. who had fished all over. And I first heard about Yately from from sort of anglers, uh, Paul Pine and, and Kim who fished over there. Um, and I'd heard about Darren, you know, from uh, Kipper George and some of the boys who fished Darren, they told me about Darren. So what happened was by me fishing Hainal, yeah. I started to put my name down on all the leisure sport lakes because yeah. I heard about Darren, which was a waiting list. Um, so I put my name down for Darren, I put my name down for Yately and all these places. But again, it's that sort of community network and learn off other anglers yeah. that you, you sort of learn. That was your network at that time, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, and that's how my... F- my fishing over the next after anal apart, I did I did fish other waters. I fished for all the leanies down in the Paxton and that as mm. well. And I fished for a lot of lakes, but because I did have a lot of time. But what I did do is from then I realised that leisure sports were the place to be. That's where the waters they had the waters. Leisure sports had the lakes. They had all the big fish, did, and they were accessible. Yeah. Did you? Did because we're going to talk more well we're going to talk now pretty much about your longfield chapter but when you came off hainal did you have any specific target in your head not in terms of venue but in terms of size of fish or in terms of area or anything like that or was it just whatever ticket came up that would have decent sized fish in it i tell you once i'd had a couple of 30s um one of the one of the big things around at the time that because i'm obviously talking about were, were certain targets that people have and one of them was 2020s in a season yeah because what you got to imagine in those days we didn't have a close season we had a close season so yeah. we, we we didn't have the spring like we've got now so catching 2020s you had to start in june 
and pretty much have it done by the winter, you know. So, and it, it took time. So that was my challenge. From when I, after anal, I wanted to go and get 2020s in a season. And that's that was my next challenge. No. Which I'd done the following season, 87, I'd done that. You did that in 87? Yeah, I'd done that in 87, yeah. I had 20 or 20s that year from a five different lakes as well. Wow. Yeah, up to my biggest fish that year was 29 out of Tip Lake at Darrenf. Um I had from five different, I caught 20s out of all the Tip, um, no, Long Lake, uh, Big Lake at Darrenf. I caught um, from that year, Tip Lake, um, I also had them out of the Paxton that year, and there was another water. I think it was five five different waters, but I had twenty twenties that year. All similar sort of approaches, bait wise, etc. Or had, had things moved on a little bit? Uh, since things had moved on a little bit. Um, Martin Cow at the time he owns SBS Bait yeah, Company. Yeah, yeah. I started to buy all my casings and that off him, and Martin realised the fish that I was catching, even though I didn't advertise them. I didn't advertise. I was catching these fish and, and they weren't getting advertised. No. You know, they was only between me and my mates. But um, he knew what I was at here. So he started getting me to test stuff for him. And I started to test his ether alcohol flavorings. And so the 87 season, um, I was using al- ether alcohol flavorings in a, in a protein base mix, which was mixed with bird food to make it cheaper. So what I was doing, I was getting my normal base mix milk protein, which was expensive with my caseins and my lactalbumins. And then I was going and buying um, Sluis CLO from a pet shop in East Ham. And it was really cheap. And what you could literally do is cut your mix in half. And it was a really good ingredient and the fish loved it. And so that was a big breakthrough for me. And that helped me catch my 2020s because, I, you know, it helped me put more bait in. You could put more, cheaper. yeah. yeah. So that was a that was a big breakthrough for me that year, and getting on Darrenf as well was was a yeah. getting my Darrenf ticket was a big breakthrough. Rigs wise, still Dacron and rig wise, I was using the same spade end hooks. Yeah, um, I'd gone my hooks had gone on a stage. I was using I think I think Gamma Katsus had just come out. I was using mm. them spade in Gamma Katsus, but also um, that was the year the chemically sharp and Drennan's come out as well. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. But the funny thing is, when them chemically sharpens Drennan's first come out, we all said, I remember this so clearly, that they're too sharp. You're hook pull. <laughs> you know, and you look at how sharp our hooks are nowadays. Yeah. So, but yeah, no, that was, a, that was a massive breakthrough. That year, getting my 2020s, and I literally, that's when my carp fishing went up another gear. Because where I'd fished down, I learned again, I'd gone and met a lot of good anglers at Darren, yeah. people like Alan Smith, Steve Briggs, you know, there, there's several names, you know, um, Terry Pefferbridge, who fished Yately at the time, you know, there, there was several names there who I gelled with, people that I gelled well with, and we learned, because I'd had big fish already, I'd had bigger fish than them. That's what I mean, you caught at the age yeah, yeah, of yeah. 15, 16, yeah. bigger fish than most of these. Oh, yeah. Top well, I see it. I mean, I, I'd fished, you know, there wasn't fish around that sort of size. So it was only as, as if an handful of waters in the whole country that had fish of that size. So so obviously they were learning off of me as well, you know, and I was learning off of them. And it, it was just, we were just learning and all the time. And, you know, there's so much going on and, you know, your rods were getting better. Your, your way you're fishing, the way you're looking for your spots are getting better. Everything yeah. was just growing, you know. It's just time on the bank as well. You've got to be one of the first ever full-time anglers, mate. Pretty much, Haven't yeah. You? You're yeah. in that first wave, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, definitely. There's a few before me, people like Ian Booker and and stuff who who done a lot of time and on the bank and and it was it's was, it was quite a few people, but it was in them early days, definitely. Yeah. I was one of the first, probably one of the first DHS sponsored. Yeah, I'm a <laughs> DHS sponsored. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, good times. But um, yeah, it was um, they were. I mean, I was only a kid, you know. Yeah. That's why I look back now and I think, my God, how young I was. And what I was doing was unbelievable, really. You know, you wouldn't want your 16-year-old kid to go and be doing week sessions all over the country, but that's what I was doing. What was you were, you said you were living with your nan, weren't you? Yeah, I was living what, with my what nan. What was your nan, your mum, what were they like about it? Were they all right? My, were they my, like... mom, my mum and dad split up when I was young and I went and lived with my nan. And But obviously I've been I've always been close with my mum and I've always had a bedroom at my mum's. But I thought it was easier for me. It was a bit cheeky of me to go and live with my nan because you can get away a lot with nans. Yeah, murder. You know, my nan would give me a big packet of sweets and, <laughs> do you know what I mean, let me go fishing where my mum was a bit stricter like like, like mums would be and nans are, all, are never... My mum now, she's, she spoils my children the same. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So I think that was a bit of a, 
a move. But my mum always wanted me to get a job, you know. She was constantly on me to get a job, you know, and she's worried about me. But saying that, um, she was happy that I was doing something that I loved. Yeah. And um and it, and I was in a good environment, you know. I weren't a lot of my mates on the on the streets and that they was, you know, they they was in a lot worse environment than I was mm. at a lake. And and what I'd done is I, I met a broad spectrum of people. Um, you know, at a fishing lake, you meet a broad, broad spectrum of people and, and them contacts I've still got now and you know, so yeah, that's you, wicked, mate, isn't it? Mm, you move on, don't you? They tell, as I alluded to before, mate, we're going to move on to your Longfield chapter. Talk to me about your time there. How did you get on there? What's the lake like at the time? Well, um, I first heard about Longfield sort of in the sort of mid-80s. Um, I heard it being talked about in very, very hushed tones. <laughs> so it was one of them places that, you know, you had to be quite high up in the ladder just to even hear about it. Yeah. It was one of yeah. them. Um, so the first time I probably heard about it would have been sort of mid eighties, uh, at one of the slideshows that I'd done. Some of the lads had fished it, Richie McDonald and people like that. I'd seen their slideshows. Roger Smith, he talked about it in his slideshow, you know, cause the who's who of carp fishing had fished Longfield. But, um, it started getting a bit closer to home when I went fish Darren cause obviously I'd got into the sort of leisure sport scene. Mm. Um, you know, I'd fished, I'd fished, um, Darren for fishy Ately. Um, and then sort of heard about anglers who are fishing on a, a long field and fishing Darumph. Um, it's a bit of a stepping stone from Darumph because obviously there wasn't a lot of big fish around in them days. And Darumph Tip Lake was probably one of the best lakes in the country, um, you know, at the time uh, for big fish. Mm. You know, it had, a, it had a few 30s in it and, and quite a few big 20s, which was, you know, it was an unbelievable lake at the time. So I'd fish Darumph. I'd had the fish out of the Darumph Tip Lake. Um, I'd had nearly all the biggins out of there. And so me and my mate Tony, it was just natural that we was going to move on to Longfield. Um, you know, that was the place to move on to from there. Um, Tony couldn't come with me because he had to go back to Anal to catch the Anal fish. Because he hadn't had Because he hadn't had them, no. He'd done the time on there with me, but he hadn't caught them. So he went back on to Anal, and this was this was 89. And... Um, I, I got myself a Longfield ticket, which at the time was about 18 quid. Mm. It was about 17, 18 quid for a ticket. And the first day I ever went over there was on my birthday. And um, it was on, I think it was my 19th birthday. And I was with a guy called Graham Rodwell. He took me over there um, for a look. And um, he, dri- I mean, I didn't drive at the time. He did. And we jumped in his old brown Cortina, I think it was. <laughs> And um, we drove all the way there, which was quite a long way from East London out to Staines. And when we got there, we had to climb a fence because obviously you weren't allowed in. It was a close season. Yeah. Um, and we had a walk round. And the first, oh, I remember this sight and I remember it till the day I die. Um, I climbed the tree. There were some really nice trees around Longfield that you could climb. They were literally like ladders. Anyway, this tree, I climbed it and I was well up high and I could see right over, the, pretty much over one part of the lake and the water was gin clear, like absolute tap water, really deep. And all of a sudden, this massive carp came into view and it swam and it waddled through past me and it had a big orange belly and it had big, sh- oh, it was just a colossal fish and it just was absolutely immense. And um, I, I nearly fell out of the tree <laughs> and that, that, was, that would have been, Looking back now, I didn't know at the time because I didn't know the fish, but that would have been Jack the Net Ripper. Wow. Yeah. And um, the following, I think it was about two weeks late, it would have been about middle of May, me and another couple of mates. My, my, I was working at the time and I was working up London. And But when I'd get home, I would just go round to anyone I knew who had a car and say to them, do me a massive favour. Do you want to come and see the best lake in the country? Come with me. <laughs> and they would drive me down there and I'd bait up. Yeah. And what I'd done is, is what I used to do, this was the close, that close season, I'd get one of my mates to drive me to Longfield. We'd pull into one of the other lakes, like Raysbury. Yeah. Or um, at the t- uh, there was another lake there called Amy's, which is the one that they call Silver Wing, the Priory. Oh, yeah. We used to park there and there was a little spit and we used to roll the bait there. So we'd go all the way down there. And roll the bait on the spit? Roll the bait on the spit or in the car park at Raysbury and then go and once it would, 
cooked, go and chuck it in Longfield by hand. How much? What were you rolling, and how much? I would were you be rolling? rolling like about, I suppose, twelve egg mix at a time. That's a fair size. Yeah, mixer. twelve egg mix. We'd, I'd, I'd knock all the twelve eggs up in a bowl. Um, add the powders, get it all into a big paste. And I wasn't ever too fussy about the, a, a load of round baits. Mm. What I used to do, I'd like a chopping board yeah. and a, a, like a, I used to roll it, rolling pin it out into, into like pizzas and stuff and into sausages and cut them and just do it like that really. Yeah. So, and then some of it would re-roll, but it'd be all different shapes and sizes. So we wasn't too worried about that. It was obviously the quality of the bait that counted and the amount and where you put it. So I baited up uh, Longfield that close season, um, going over there sort of three or four times, putting 12 egg mixes out. And I was using fish mills at the time, Premier Baits fish mills. Okay. And um, what, they obviously hadn't seen them before because it was right in the early days. And the guy that I was going to fish it with, who joined it with me, was Jeff Bowers. Who, yeah, <laughs> yeah it, 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 Jeff joined it with me. And um, we were going to fish it. And that was that was our plan for the year, like, you know. The first two weeks of the season, we didn't go down there. Um, we fished elsewhere because we thought we let it settle down. You know, he's always going to be busy, all the, you know, yeah. the big rush. And it was about three weeks into the season that I'd done my first ever trip to Longfield. Uh, a guy called Davy Pike, he drove me down there in his car uh, from East London, dropped me down there. And all I had, I remember, was a big sack of base mix, a load of eggs and a load of tins of tuna and a couple of loaves of bread. So I was going to live the whole trip on tins of tuna and loaves of bread. How long did you plan on staying? I was there for 10 nights. 10 nights. 10 night session. So I had to go home and sign on. Yeah. Because okay, I'd just gone yeah. to sign on. Like, that's, you know. <laughs> and it was, I, again, I was only 19. I was a kid, like, you know. So what I'd done is I'd, I, I'd, I'd listened and listened and listened. I, I'd heard people talk about Longfield and, you know, little bits, little snippet here, a snippet there, but I didn't really know anything about it. But mm. one thing I did know is out in front of the secret swim, there was a gravel bar. I'd heard someone say it before over Darrenth that he'd fished the secret and out in the middle there's a bar. So I thought, you know what? If I go there and the secret's free, I'm going to go in the secret swim. I'm going to find the bar out in the middle and I'm going to put the biggest bed of fish mills he's ever had yeah. on top. When you were baiting up, sorry to interrupt you, mate. Um, were you baiting up specific spots? Did you bait up that bar or were you just putting in bait? When I, was, when I was baiting up, I didn't know where anything was. Mm. Um, so all I was doing was chucking it in all around the margins by hand just to get them seeing it, you know. So yeah. um, I'd just go there and just spray it around just so there was a bit on the bottom, you know, just so they'd seen the bait and, you know, they were coming across it. So um, that, you know, that I'm sure that helped to some extent because I probably put a good 40 or 50 eggs mix in. Yeah. So that they, they would have seen a bit of that. One of them or some of them would have seen that. But when I got there for my actual trip, my first trip, the first night I was doing the 10 nights, I got in the secret, I got there. I don't think there'd been much caught. I think there'd been one of the big mirrors had been out and one common, and it was about three weeks into the season. I mean, it was such a hard lake. It really was tough. What was the head of carp in at the time? <sighs> I don't I don't know exactly. Um, I think someone said about what it was the other day, but I, I don't reckon there was many more than 10 mirrors. Yeah. And 15 commons or something like that. And it was fairly 15, big, 15, 20 it? commons. It was about five or six acres, wasn't yeah. it? And it was deep and really weedy and full of snags. Absolutely full of snags all round it. 18 foot deep over most of it. Thick <sighs> with Canadian pondweed to the surface. But um, I found the bar. I remember I had a float. And one of the good things that I had going for me at Longfield was the season previous, I'd fished Johnson's as well. And Johnson's was a deep lake. And I learned about drops, how to get a drop and count the lead down properly in deep water. I'd f- done drops before when I was at Darmouth, uh on a tip. I used to do the drop um, to find the backs of bars, this side of bars, whether you're on top of the bar or not. But when I fished Johnson's, it was a lot different because it was about 18 foot deep. And, and so you'd have to count six or seven seconds before the lead land. Yeah. So you knew if you was on a bar, it'd be three seconds. And that's what we used to do. Like, so with Longfield, I had a big edge. A lot of the guys here didn't know about drops, I'm sure, at the time. 
And I did. And what I did is I, I, I would just go in a swim, cast, 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 cast. And as soon as I got that sort of three seconds, I knew I was in shallower water. So that's how I found the bar out in the middle. So casting, casting, I found the shallow bar out in the middle. Then I put a float on it. Once I knew where it was, I put a float on it. But I, I used to, it was a different float. It was like a pike bung. Right. It was a pike bung that slid up the line. Yeah, yeah. Because it was so weedy, you, you wouldn't get yeah. the float up. So it was a pike bung. I just wanted it as a marker. And then what I've done is I sat there. I always remember it clearly. I sat there and rolled the biggest bed of bait. It took me all day. I didn't cast out the first night. <laughs> I waited till the next day. I left no rods in the first night, just watched the lake. And as soon as it was light, I rolled this monster bed of bait. I'd found my spot already when I got there the first day. And in the second day, I rolled me big bed of bait. And I uh, always remember the first guy who walked into my swim was Rob Mailing. No way. And it was the first time I ever seen Rob. And uh, Rob, being cheeky like he was, he looked at all the bait on the floor and he shook his head in disbelief. And um, he just went, you won't catch him like that. He said, we've already tried that. And I was rolling this massive bigger bait. And um, How anyway. did you feel when he said that? Did you feel a bit dejected? Or bit did you def- feel- started, yeah, a bit deflated, but yeah. I'd, I'd had so many big fish. I'd, had so, yeah. I'd already had. I was 19 then. You know, it's four years after I caught my anal 30s, and I'd done a lot since then. I fished a lot of lakes. So I'd had a lot of experience. So I just smiled at Rob and, you know, me and Rob got on really well and we were mates from day one, you know. And he showed me my first ever long field fish. Funny enough, uh, it was that day. Um, he went off floater fishing and caught um, Heart Tail. Wow. 3112 off the top, you know, and he'd done a lot of time on there and he'd struggled a lot, Rob, on there, like yeah. everyone did. It was rock hard. So you can imagine how, how happy he was. And I, and I ran and netted it for him. Did you net it for yeah, him? Yeah, I netted it for him, yeah. I was up a tree at the time, and um, I could see this group of fish out in front of him taking floaters. Mm. Um, he was on, He was. I could see this group of fish, and I was up, up a tree in the secret swim, looking out right across the lake, and it's a real good tree to climb. And all of a sudden, um, I see Rob, I see a massive big eruption, and I see him standing with his rod bent. So I run around there and netted it for him, 31-12. I've still got the photo indoors. What an amazing moment that yeah, is. Yeah, so that was my first one I see on the bank. Anyway, that week, I'd done 10 nights. Um, I'd fished over this massive bigger bed of bait that I'd put out on the first day. And on the third day, they started showing on me in the dark. Yeah, I remember it clearly. They were showing on me in the dark, and a couple of my mates, were they come over to see me. Uh, they drove all the way down to see me and they were sitting in me swim and we were watching them right on top of me, boshing on top of this massive bed of fish meals. So we knew that, um, you know, things were looking up because they yeah. were right on top of this bar out in the middle. And uh, two days later, I think it was on my sixth day, sixth, seventh day, um, I had a fish off the spot. I had my cool. first one out of Longfield, 21 pound mirror. Yeah. What a result that is. Yeah, massive result. Unbelievable result. So uh, Chris Ball come around to take the photos. There's some names here, mate. Isn't yeah, there? yeah, that's it. I mean, at the time on there, you had Dave Moore, Chris Ball, Jan Wentzka, you know, Steve Alcott was fishing it, uh, Rob Malin, all, all, you know. It's the, the who's the, who of carpet, Yeah, isn't it? Lockie, they were all on there, you know. Everyone was on there. Um, How did you feel about that, just sharing the space with those boys? Were you intimidated yeah, or? Not really. No? Not really, you know. I, I sort of fished big, big fish waters. Yeah. Hainal, you know, we uh, we got to meet a lot of superstars on there and we did at Darrenth, you know, and uh, and that was that. So I wasn't that intimidated. I was I was relishing learning off of them as well. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And going up, it's like going up. It's like if you was a footballer, you want to play with the best, don't you? Yeah, of course you do. So I was where I wanted to be, you know, fishing for the best fish and, and sitting around the best anglers learning, you know. Yeah. So um, over the next uh, few few trips... I'd done really well at Longfield. I think I landed six carp out of there. Which, That's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Do you That's, think the fish meals and the pre-bait and everything were the key? Yes, but I also caught some off the top as well. Um, you know, I grew up a big floater angler. And what I used to do, I used to fish the nights on the bottom um, at Longfield, fishing over my big beds of bait. And at 12 o'clock, I'd reel in and fish all day floater fishing. I really worked hard. I really worked hard, and I caught I caught fish doing that as well. I caught my personal best common uh, on a chum mixer at the Royal Box Swim, um, twenty one pound twelve ounce. It was a big common then for me, 
uh, for anyone in them days. Yeah, 20 is a massive. Uh, 20 common, and it was a fish that's still alive now, funny enough. It's a fish, they, it's in a halt, and it's called Sid. And that was in to Horton, has it? And that's nineteen eighty nine, yeah. Well all the Longfield fish went to Horton. Yeah. They okay. were yeah, all the original uh, all the original Horton fish were the Longfield fish. Um I didn't know they all went there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they all went to Horton. The old lot. Uh they the like they, they the year that I fished Longfield, they closed it down that year. Yeah. That was the last year. Yeah, and I ended up catching six fish um, over my first three ten nighters. I suppose it's a month's fishing is quite a lot of fishing, but for there that was good. That's good going. That's rock hard, like you know. I always there used to be a magazine. There used to be a book called The Guide to Carp Waters, right. BK Guide to Carp Waters in the old days, and they used to have ratings of how hard a lake was, and there would be moderate, hard. You know, very hard. And then there was super difficult. And Longfield was in the super difficult bracket. And I always remember, as I'm a kid, I look at that and I think, yeah, I want to catch one from there. Super difficult. That's the challenge I want. Yeah. And, you know, and then to have had six fish out of there. But I'd not had one of the A-team. So I had six carp and I'd not had one of the A-team. Um, and I was thinking my time's starting to run out. It's mid-August. Some of the other guys were jumping on the bait because they'd seen the fish that I was doing. Yeah. People were fishing on my spots. Um, so I was losing ground. I'd had a big edge. My edge was sliding away from me because other anglers were jumping onto my methods and what I was doing, you know, uh, piling the bait in on these shallow bar. Well, they're still not shallow. There's 12 foot of water on them, but shallower yeah. bars. Anyway, on my fourth session, I got there and the weed was horrendous. It was so, it was really was. It was literally touching the surface. And I went round to all the spots that I'd been fishing and I couldn't get a lead on the bottom. The weed had literally grown over the bars. It got so high. We'd had a bit of hot weather. And it took me all day to find a spot. And the spot that I found was literally 15 yards from the bank. It was that yeah. close. But I got the lead went down. I felt the lead go. I s- pulled back. It was nice and clear. And I thought, well, that's it. That's all I've got. The only option I've got. So I piled in a load of bait again. Another big bait making session on the bank. Uh, fired it all out onto the spot. You know, two rods on there. Both trammed up. Literally two foot apart. That's how I fished. Rig-wise, um, what were your rigs at this um, point? I was using, like, as I said, the sort of, what, the whipping knot yeah. with the hair off the end. Um, I think I was using uh, Dacron. But I, I think, funny enough, I think uh, Kevin brought out Gamma Braid yeah. that year. And I was using, that was the first year that we pretty much had a a, a some a different type of... um Oakland. Yeah, of braided up clink, apart from Dacron, which was a bit thin, really. Dacron could break, and this stuff was a bit... So I was using a bit of a mixture of Dacron and Gamma Braid mm. that year, because I remember that first coming out. But my hooks were still um, the Kamazan, um, or Kamatsu in them days, I think they were called, um, which was super sh- sharpened hooks. That's what I was using up there. And I was just using running leads, two-ounce pear lead, running with a bead. Mm. And that was it, you know? Yeah. Um, so anyway, I found my spots, I got my drop, I got all my bait in the area. And I remember for three days, every morning, I see a big fish come out on my spot every morning for three days over this big bed of bait, but not a touch. I reckon they'd clean me out. I probably was nothing there. So on the fourth day, I rolled another lot of bait, but this time I went for it. I started rolling really small baits like sort of 12, 14 millers. And I spent all day rolling these tiny baits, all really small, all hand rolled, two <laughs> at a time. And they really worked hard to get this better bait. Anyway, I could fit like 10 or 20 in a catty. That's how small they was. And I sprayed it all over this little close bar at 15 yards and um, really piled it in. And the next morning, I see another big fish come over it. So they were on me. And I think it was on the sixth morning, the following morning, I was sitting there and um, I thought, you know what, I'm going to roll because it had gone quiet and my spot had gone dead. I hadn't seen a fish all morning. It was the first morning I hadn't seen a fish and my spot was totally dead. And all of a sudden I had two bleeps and I looked up and I always remember I see the tip just slowly bending over. And I was using Cardinal 155s at the time. And then I think there was like three little ticks off the clutch and I jumped up, picked the rod up, and I just felt this really heavy lunge 
on the end and it just took a load of line off of me, probably 10 metres of line, and so it went solid in the weed. Went totally solid in the weed. So I pulled and pulled, nothing. Put the rod down and started getting really nervous, thinking this is probably my only chance of the year that mm. I might get, you know, because I could see time was slipping away. Um, you know, and I'd, it was a rock hard lake. So I sat there for probably 20 minutes and nothing happened. That rod didn't happen. Nothing. It was. So I jumped up and I started really pulling it, giving it a bit extra and seeing if I could get it moving and really like sort of putting the test curve into the rod. I was only using soft rods. I was using uh, 26 ounce Bruce and Walkers that year, which are one pound, 10 ounce yeah. test curve Bruce and Walkers, yeah. you know, on really weedy lakes. So you can imagine what that was bending like. So anyway, I got this weed bed moving eventually. And this weed bed was coming in inch by inch. And you know the Canadian when it rips off at the bottom and it's just like this massive bunch. Yeah, it's like and a you've fridge. got all the roots and it's like yeah. 10 foot tall. So I'm getting this massive bunch of Canadian. Anyway, this bed of weed is so big, it's filled the whole front of my swim. And I thought this fish is probably gone anyway. Yeah. It's probably gone. So I'm nervous. I'm shaking. I've thrown my rod on the floor and I start ripping all this weed apart this um, Canadian apart, all of a sudden I see the biggest carp I've ever seen in my life in there, big black thing, you know, with all scowled and a big orange belly and it just powered out the weed through the other side. So my line's going through this weed. Now this fish is out oh. in the open water, kiting around, going mad, like really trying to get away. So it was absolute carnage. So anyway, I couldn't net it. It just, it just was impossible to net because... The weed was so bad. So I jumped in the lake with my net. And what I tried to do was hand line it up, yeah. up um, hand line it up into the weed a little bit. And that wasn't working. And I got the rod again and I pumped it into the weed. And then it was just, this was going on for ages. Anyway, eventually the fish got stuck in the top of the weed. It just got stuck and it was sitting there with this big black out, back out. So I threw the rod, dropped, yeah. dropped the rod, got in the net and just started pushing as hard as I could. Now I'm treading water in 10 foot of water here. <laughs> treading water. So you're not even got feet I'm on the bottom? Got, no, I'm 10 foot of water and I'm treading water. So I eventually get the the arms of the landing net around this massive big bronze black mirror that's in the middle of the net. So now, as soon as them arms are around it, mm. I start screaming for help because I was... Time was running out. I was in the weed. I was drowning. Going down. Um, the fish was there. And there was a guy fishing on the other side whose name was Peter, who used to be in a famous band called Motley Hoople in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And um, he used to, he was, there's a really famous record they sung, All the Young Dudes, which I'm sure we've all heard and your mum and dad would all know. And that. So um, he was, he was, he was a rock star, this guy. And he used to fish Longfield and he used to fish with pink rods. <laughs> And he had, his bivy was a TARDIS and he had a leopard skin um oh, ground, ground sheet. sheet. Ground sheet, yeah. That is rock and roll, isn't and it? And he had he, he had platform shoes and long hair and his <laughs> carp jacket was like some sort of purple uh, two tone what thing. What a boy. He was such a character and um I started screaming for his help. He was fishing right on the other side and he must have heard me because he come running round and he dragged me out the lake. And by the landing net pole. So he grabbed the landing net pole, dragged me, because I was still holding the, the ribs. Yeah, you ain't letting that go, were no, you? No, no, no. So anyway, I'm I'm still holding the, the, the landing net around this fish. So anyway, he's dragged me in. I've looked at the fish and know straight away it's the big one, Jack the Net Ripper. Yeah. So we've hoisted it onto the bank. We weighed it uh, 42 pounds. Oh, my God. So massive, obviously, beat my pit. Beat my uh, Hainal, my personal best from Hainal easily. Um, <clears throat> put it in the sack, in the carp sack, and I swam it right down the margins, down into deep water and tied it to a root so no one could get it. So no one could get near this fish, even though I knew Peter, but I just didn't want to leave that fish. Who might get it? So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's That's how it was, it. though, you was know. Was it pretty bad? Yeah, in the... Oh. It wasn't so much at Longfield, you know, but in the past I'd heard of, you know, not 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 Longfield. It wouldn't have happened there, but in the past I'd heard of about fish getting away and people taking fish out of sacks oh and my stuff. God. So this is my prize of my life. Yeah. I know that. So I made sure it's totally secure, right out of the way, swam it down <laughs> underwater. <laughs> you must. Tiny, yeah. You are Literally, that's gospel truth. And um, <laughs> in them days I didn't have a phone. I didn't even have a camera. 
at that year because my camera I dropped in the tip like the winter previous. No. It fell in the lake, yeah. Um, so I didn't have a camera. So what I'd done is I asked Peter to stay with me tackle. I did this fish up anyway. No one was finding the fish. And I said to Pete, look, I ain't going to be long because Peter had a good camera. But I said, I'd like to go and get a couple of my mates, Dan, who know what they're doing. Like, I didn't want to say it to Peter, yeah, but yeah. my mates knew what they were doing with cameras, you know. And um, so what I've done is I've run all the way to the phone box, which was a mile, like a good, good mile down the road. So I've run as fast as I could. And I phoned my nan's house and I asked for my dad and my dad weren't in at the time. And I said to my nan, if you see him, tell him to go to Hainault Forest get anyone with a camera who's one of my mates and get them straight down here. I've got the biggest fish, one of the biggest carp in the country. They've got to come. What got a to phone come. call. Yeah, so <laughs> when I left the phone box, as I was walking back, Chris Ball pulled up. He pulled up and he said, what are you, what are you doing? Because he could see that I was flustered. Mm. And I said, I'd had one. And he went, I know. But the day before, I'd caught one off the top. Yeah, I caught a little common off the top, and I think his friend Yan had told him, and he thought it was that one, and he thought about. it was that one, and I said, "No, I've had another one," and he's like, "You're joking! What you had now?" I said, "I've got the bigger in the net, forty two, and he's like, "Unbelievable!" And as luck had it, Chris had his video camera in his car, and I got a video. Um, Chris also had photographs, um, done some photographs for me, but Peter's photographs come out brilliant as well. He's he, he, Peter had a state of the art camera. So I ended up with really good photographs and a video of it. And um, what a fish, man! And just after I put it back, my my dad turned up with about five anglers and all <laughs> with all their cameras. Wicked, yeah. What? Uh, do you have a party after that? I'll bet, yeah. Mate. Do you know what? I packed up and went home. Yeah. I went. I went over Anal. I just. I got my dad to take me. We packed up all my stuff. We all went to Anal and just partied all week at Anal. Mate, what? At that point, a forty pounder, mate. Mm. Uh, that's just madness, isn't it? Yep, certainly was. So that, in terms of, was that your, the end of your chapter on, on Longfield or, or did you go back for like the I remainder went, of... I, I went back to try and catch some more um, out of there and the fish that I really wanted to catch was um, was a fish called Big Scowl. That was my target. And uh, sadly, I never caught that fish. Um, it never come out that season. Mm. And um, that year it closed down. That yeah. was the end of it. And it ended up in Alton and they all ended up in Alton and that was it. And it was the end of my chapter. I did never go and fish Alton. Um, I didn't agree with a, with a fish being moved into Alton. So I, I, I didn't agree with that. So that was the end of my long field fishing. What a chapter though. Your first 40, mate. And oh, yeah. Mate, it will never happen again because it's not there. No, nope, that's it. And, it, and, it, and to catch it from that lake as well because of the reputation and the people that had fished it before me and the people that were fishing it at the time. So. Talking of reputations, mate, Save. Save, yeah, that's another one, isn't it? That's, You're still there now, up, mate, yeah. isn't yeah. you? still a member, still a member. Yeah. But by rights, looking at the timeline, after Longfield... It was on to Savvy, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, it was. we stayed in the valley. I mean, I think once I got in the Cong Valley, that was it. I never really come out of there for a long time. The big CV, um, mate. You don't come out, do you? What happened was, while I was at um, Longfield, I got to know a lot of the Cong Valley anglers who were fishing on places like the Cons, Waltonians, Savvy, you know, uh, the fisheries, you know, yeah. all the main lakes, because they'd all come and fish Longfield, because obviously none of them had a 40 in. No, Savay never had a 40. None of them did. Cons, my mate Andy, who I fished um, Longfield with, he he uh, he caught the first 40 out of the cons, and that would have been the following year. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, I went on to Savay that winter. When they closed down um, Longfield, mm. there wasn't, you know, I was looking around thinking, where can I go? Where can I go? And it was obvious, because I'd spoken to Rob... Um, and a few of the boys who had fished Savay, like the famous five lads, mm. um, like Lockie and Wibley and, and that, they, they'd all sort of said how great Savay was. And it was just a no brainer that I was going to have to go and fish there. And luckily enough, um, a mate of mine who I fished Longfield with, he, he lived not too far from Savay. So what happened was we started to, um, to do the, to do the days cause it was days only. It was a day, yeah. it was a day ticket like, and we started to do the days only on there that winter. And um, so that was my first really time I ever fished Savay. That would have been sort of 19, the winter of 89. 
at the start of 1990, I started fishing on there and uh, was going over there doing days with our soft rods. I mean, we were well out of gun when we when I think about it. We were using one and a half pound test curve rods on Savve. Was that the know? biggest the biggest venue you'd, you'd tackled in yeah, terms of size? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I'd fished the reservoirs in London. I'd, I'd, so I'd fished decent sized venues, but... But Savoy was 70 acres and mm. all islands and, you know, it, it took a long time. And, and especially with a tackle we had, you know, you just about get over the second bar. I could just about, I remember fishing it clear. Now it's crazy when I think. <laughs> it's totally changed now, Savoy, because when I first fished it, you feel the bars really easy. There was, you know, I could only really get over the second. You might just mm. get to the third if you had six pound line. Um, but you'd fill the bars as you as you pulled the lead up the bars. You'd fill them go right up, and then you'd fill them drop down the other side. Where over the years now, you don't feel that the same. No, 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 because the water is so strong. Water, yeah, it's just corroded the bars. Yeah. Same as Harrow is the same as well. That's famous for its gravel bars, and again, very similar to that. You know, the sharpness goes. Yeah. So all the flint bit goes because it all gets rounded off, a bit like the pebbles in the sea. Yeah. You know, so it all gets rounded off. So, yeah, and that that was my first experience of um, of Savay and how much I, I fell in love with it. The trouble was with Savay um, <clears throat> was me actually fishing it was really hard because I didn't have a car um, and you couldn't night fish. So it meant um, I had to sleep in the field over the back. Is that what you were doing? Yeah, I was. I was the last time I fished it around that era uh, was probably about 1990. I was sleeping in a field, literally living in a field over the back. Didn't have a lot of food, um, and I was just doing the days. So I was fishing all day, dragging my gear up the canal bank, doing the day. And I remember Peter Regan fishing up there. Yeah, and. Um, he was in the uh, Andes that week and I was going up and fishing next to him because, you know, Peter always used to make me a bacon sandwich. In He's the a character as well, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Get a wind up off him and all. But, yeah, uh, what sort of wind up? Is he a good one? <laughs> oh, you always get a wind up off Pete, don't you? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that was that was then. And, uh, you know, I, I absolutely fell in love with Savo, but it was really, really difficult yeah. for me to, to do any time on there. And... Um, you know, because of because of the logistics of it, you know, I had to trains and I couldn't rely on my mate to take me all the time. He had a job, he had a life, you know, as well. Um, but that's how that started another chapter for me because around that sort of time was when I started to fish the cons as well. So yeah. Savay and the cons sort of merged together. And once I got a ticket for the cons, I stopped fishing Savay on the days, but I always kept my ear to the ground of what's going on at Savay because I had several friends who were on the syndicate. Yeah. So throughout my sort of the next 20 odd years, I pretty much heard a lot of the fish that got caught. I kept my one ear to the ground because it was always a part of me that wanted to be there. What, 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 why, why is that? Why is there that affinity for Savay then? Talk to me about that. In the early days, you said straight away, <laughs> You wanted to be there. You loved it. Yeah, you went to the cons and you did all that as well. But it, it's been a part of you now, as you say, for 20 yeah. years. What is it about Savo? I think I think going back, um, obviously, there's the nostalgia of um, of the books that I read when I was a ch- when I was really young, like the Carp Strikes Back. Um, mm. My first ever carp fishing books I read was Carp Strikes Back and Rod Hutchison's carp book, which had a lot of stuff about Savo. I'd also um, I'd also seen um, slideshows from Savoy anglers like Bob Jones, Roger Smith, people like that. Um, so, you know, that had a massive impact on me. Um, I first went to Savoy in about 85. I think a mate of mine was having some rods built by Bob Jones. That was my first time up there. And so he always had that, you know, and there was there was a lot. Of, there was probably more 30s in Savoy than the rest of the country put together. Yeah. In them days, it never had much. It weren't until Albert caught those spawn bound 40s. Previous to that, you know, a, a big fish, a monster from Savo would be a mid 30, like a 34, 35. I think Steve Alcott had a 36. Which is still a massive fish, though. It's a massive fish in them days. It was yeah. a colossal fish. But it had such a good stock of fish that it was, you know, and some of them were beautiful. And, and it was just another one of them to get it ticked, ticked off you. Your wish list, you know, you call, I'd call Biggins from Tip Lake. I'd call yeah. Longfield, you know, Darren from Tip Lake, which was massive in them days. Longfield was massive in them days. Another one was Savoy. Yeah. You know, they, they were, they, they were the elite. Your ticks yeah, in the boxes. Yeah. It. So, you know, and then I got that and, 
And um, so my Savoy thing, Savoy is probably the lake that I've sort of been in love with or and, and have fished on and off now. Because I went back and done the day ticket in 1990, then I would have gone back in sort of late 90s and had a go. And all mid-90s, I went and had another go. You know, so I slowly used to go there and put me head through the door. It wasn't until about 2007 that I really decided to have a good go at Savé. I think it was about then. No, it might have been before then. It might have been about 2003. But in the for, 2000s, so quite yeah, relatively, relatively new. Yeah, I got back my day ticket, um, which I'd had, you know... Over the years, on and off, I'd had a day ticket on there. So I got my day ticket back and I went there with a totally different uh, outlook. When I first went to Savay, it was an outlook of, well, I want to get on the syndicate. You know, I really want to get on the syndicate, um, blah, 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 um, you know. And like we all did, you know, me and all my mates, of course we wanted to get on the syndicate. We wanted to do the nights there, like, you know, we didn't want to do the days. But when I went back there in the early 2000s, I went back there and I I was in a much different position then. I had a car, you know, I had a job, you know, I, I you know, my life was a lot more stable. Yeah. Um, I had a lot more experience as well in fishing. And so I decided to just go there and catch a Savoy carp on the days. And that was my plan to go there, catch a Savoy carp. If, if a night ticket came up, then all good. If not, it doesn't matter. I just want to go there and catch a Savoy carp. And that's what I've done. I went on there 2003 or 2004, whenever it was, and just to just go and catch a Savoy carp. And that's what I've done. And, and I spent all summer, a lot of that summer, to catch my first Savoy carp. And, Talk to me about that first carp, mate. Yeah. And the capture. That was, um, it was, a, I went up there and done a day. A cup, I think I've done a day. or I might have done two days. And I was in the secret swim. And, um, no, no, I wasn't in a secret. I was in the shallows. And um, I bumped into Johnny Harry, who I hadn't seen for years and stuff, you know, since I was young. And I was bumping into some people that I hadn't seen. So it was great, yeah, you know, yeah, just yeah. go over there and see the lake that I love. And and, I'd, and it had been so many years. I'd learned a lot since about carp fishing, different ways of fishing. So, you know, I had so much to add to what I did when I was there in 1990, when I was only 20, you know. Yeah. So what I'd done is I, I started to fish... Um, in the in the shallows because it's an obvious place for day ticket to fish. It's shallow water. The fish going to go there in the daytime. Blah blah blah. But I didn't see a great deal. And then I reeled in um, in the afternoon and went for a walk. Baited sort of looked at, looked around a, a couple of areas and and I baited up with some uh, floating bread down on the road bank in the weed bed. So all I've done is I, I you know I put a bit of floating bread out in the weed bed mm. down on the road bank. Um, and to see if there's anything moving around in the weed on the road bank because there was a load of floating weed, like the whole, nearly the whole of the road bank was a big bunch of floating weed. So I had a bit of bread in my bag, so I threw a bit of bread in just to see what happened and went through a walk. And when I come back, there's a carp there slurping it in, <laughs> slurping the bread in. So I was pretty shocked. So I went, ran and got my tackle, moved up to the road bank, um, put a bit more bread out, put a few mixers out, put one bait on the bottom. Um, anyway, a couple of hours later, the fish had gone and I went home. But while I was driving home, I was thinking, you know what? All I've got to do is get a rod in front of that fish. Mm. And I got a chance of catching my first set of a carp, like, you know. And over the next three or four weeks, I think it was about two or three days a week, I was going up there. I was going to work in the morning, doing what I had to do. I was going in really early, about five Work until nine, half nine. Then at half nine, I was driving all the way to Savay, just as the traffic eased up, doing a two or three hour session at Savay, and then driving all the way back home again. So it was a right lot of hard work, but I was doing it a couple of times a week. But I just wanted to keep going there just to see if I see this fish again appear that was sucking in the bread. Sure enough, um, I started seeing it regular. What, what was the fish? It was this big, long, dark fish. And it was in this weed bed regular. And every time I threw bread in it, it just come up and start having a little slurp around and that. And um, anyways, over the next three or four weeks, I was going up there regular. One rod, loaf of bread, a few mixers, just free lining, literally free lining big lumps of bread flake into this weed and that, just seeing if this fish would turn up. Anyway, this day come and it turned up this fish and it, Come and it took a couple of baits. It took a couple of baits and then it come up to me up 
bait and then it just went to take it and it missed it. <laughs> and this happened two or three times and I could see that because you, you're not going to fish somewhere like Savay with light line. No. On the top. The trouble is with floater fishing, you pretty much have to use light line. But like, I ain't going to want to lose a fish, you know. I fished for big fish on the top before. I'd rather not hook one. So I'm using 15 pound line pretty much. So the chances of actually hooking it, it's a pretty slim, but... Um, I tried everything to hook this fish. It kept coming up. It kept missing the bait. It spat the bait. But every time I went there, it was there. It was unbelievable. Anyway, one day I turned up and the swim was alive with fish. No. Yeah, it weren't just one. There must have been 20 of them. And they were swimming past me feet, 40s, 30s, which is an amazing fish. Wow. All, I, I must have, I don't know, they just turned up that day. And all, I chucked a load of bread in and they just started having it. They just started having it one after the other. They were coming up, having the bread, having the mixers. And um, there was this big common and it was taking it right by my foot. And I lowered a rod right in front of him and he just come up, took my bait. I struck, rod just hooped over <sighs> and his fish just steamed off. It literally jumped out of the lake and hook pulled. It, no. Yeah, it just steamed off. And it, it was so shocked. It sort of like towel, not towel, but sort of lifted itself over a weed bed oh, and the hook come mate. out. So that was the first one I hooked. Um, anyway, about a week later, I was back down there and um, nothing was, nothing was, um, nothing was about. It was very quiet. And my friend Dave was going over to fish the cons and he phoned me up and he said, do you fancy doing a night on the cons tonight with us? And I said, yeah, I wouldn't mind that. I said, let me do another hour just to see if this fish turns up. I said, because, I, you know, I really don't know if it's, if it's going to come again or if not. Anyway, I was sitting there and give it about an hour. And all of a sudden, I just see this bow wave coming through between two islands coming into the bay that I was fishing. And then it just disappeared in the weed, this. So my heart was racing. <laughs> so what I've done is I positioned this bait. So my heavy line was over the weed. And all that the bait was was about an inch past the weed. And there was a small hole. Anyway, I put, I spread, uh, laced all the holes with bread and mixers and just sat there watching this single bread, bit of like literally a freed rod length from the bank. Anyway, this fish, I could, I knew it was a rand and I could just sense it was about. And then I looked and I didn't want to take my eye off my bait because I, I, I'd made that mistake before. If I don't see my right bait, I might not strike yet. Yeah. And I see this fish coming along and it was having each one. It was taking and it was just coming perfectly straight for me. And as he come up to take my bait, he sucked it in and then he stopped midair. Now, every time I'd seen him take that bait, he took it and moved on. Yeah. Carried on. This time he was in trouble and I could see it. His gob was sitting out the air and I just struck and he was in. I was Ooh. in. Yeah. And he took a load of line off me and he weeded me up. Anyway, I was into it for about 15 minutes, this fish, because it was so totally weeded up. And um, it, it, it'd it start coming, and then it'd go, and then it'd come, and then it'd go. And and in the end, a friend of mine who who's a, a member down there, who I, I fish with on the cons, Carl, I spoke to him, and he he um, he said, I'll get John Harry for you. See if John will come down and give you an hand, yeah. like, you know, because I was all on my own. Anyway, John come down uh, in his in his punt, yeah, you need a boat, didn't he you? He punted down, and um, and uh, and that was it. We went and got it out of the water. I got it out of the water. John let me go out. I made a total ash of it. What do you in mean? Front what of John. happened? I think I dropped my net. <laughs> I think as I was going to net, something happened, and my, my net dropped and started sinking to the bottom of the lake. It was it was uh, one of them. Yeah. But anyway, it was uh, once the feeling of getting that fish, especially after the amount of time that I'd been trying to stalk it over the previous few weeks. And the loss. And um, yeah, and it ended up uh, sort of forty pound lever and all. It was a it was a fish they called the little towel lever. Are you having a laugh? Yeah, it was a little towel lever, which is an absolute belter of a fish. And when I net it, like I've got it on the bank, and we lifted it up, and John looked at me and he shook me hand. He went, "You got yourself a mid forty there, son." He said, "That's a that's a mid forty that that's one. That's a little towel lever." Ridiculous fish, man! Yeah. For a first fish, no, it's my first one. Yeah, yeah, it makes the hairs in the back of my neck stand oh, up. Oh yeah, I was blown away. And then after that, my next challenge was to get one out of there off the bottom. Yeah. You know, that was it. That was it for my, f you know, after that, I'd, I'd done a little bit more float fishing after that, but <clears throat> there wasn't a lot going on. Um, and then I wanted to get one off the bottom. 
And you got one? Yeah, I, I, the following year I started fishing Was it the it next again. year, yeah? Yeah, the follow, okay. I, I didn't do much more on there that year. I'd done a few days, um, you know, and then the following year I started fishing it again, uh, this time on the bottom in the Cottage Bay and on the road bank and the weed was horrendous. It was blowing, it was, there was a lot of weed blowing around that year and it was all on the surface. Mm. Um, there weren't a lot of spots and one of the spots that I was fishing weeded over and I couldn't get to it. So I had to move and I wasn't happy about it. And um, I weren't happy at all because I, I felt as if I was making headway uh, yeah. along the road bank. And then the weed, there was this weed bed floated in and it, you just, you couldn't get rod in. So I had to move into the cottage bay. Anyway, <laughs> I'd done, I had two or three days on me, on two or three days ahead of me. And um, I think my my wife had took my son to her mum's and I had a few days. So what I'd done is I went in the cottage bay and I thought, oh, I'm going to put some bait out and sit on it, do a couple of days on it. So I, I put some bait out. What uh, bait were you on at this point? Mate? I, I was using um, a mixture of um, fish meals, a uh, red spicy fish, the urban red spicy fish, yeah. uh, along with uh, some some of their pellet, the red spicy pellet and hemp. Yeah, those three mixed to like a, a thirty sort of thirty percent of each, you know. So they were the three baits that I was using anyway. So I spawned out um, sort of. It, it wasn't that far. I think it was about 20 wraps I was fishing. I didn't want to go too far, but the fish, because the weed was so bad, the fish were coming in pretty close anyway. Yeah. But for Savay, 20 wraps is close because there's a lot of the guys on there really good at long range fishing. Right. So that, a short range fishing for Savay. Anyway, the next morning when I arrived, because uh, you were allowed on at six, so I'd fished the day before. The next morning when I arrived, as I got down into my swim, I was just... I'd had all my rods clipped up and everything on my spot and my new bait, so I could get my rods out pretty clip quick. But as I just was putting down my rod bag and about to get my rods ready, a fish come out right on the baited area and went down and started bubbling on me right over the hemp and pellet and boily light, you know. So I knew that I was, uh, I knew that that morning I, I just thought, you know, well, this is, this is, this is it. This is going to happen. Yeah. This is going to be my spot. Um, but I thought I'd spook it. I thought, you know what? I'm going to spook this fish. What, by chucking a lead you're out? You're going to have to put two leads out yeah, there. Yeah. So one of the reasons I, I wanted to fish just at 20 wraps was to use a light lead. Yeah. So I could get there in the morning because I've done a lot of day session fishing over the years. I've fished the Waltonians for years. I've fished Sutton. I've fished the Rezies. So I've done loads of days. So I know how to fish days. And, um, you know, the game is, is to get your rods in early, quiet as you can. So I was only using light leads, just enough to get me 20 wraps. So I banged these two leads, 20 wraps. They both landed bang on, and I put them on the rest. And I didn't see another fish, but at half past 10, one of them just melted off. No. Yeah, it just melted off. And um, I had an epic battle in the cottage bay. It's just shallow in close, and uh, it was an epic battle when my heart was in my mouth. And um, I landed a, a, a really old mirror, like a real old warrior, dark, big, dark, really dark. And, and speaking to John Harry, he says ancient fish, one yeah. of the originals at 36 and a half. Wow. What um, a couple of fish. Yeah. So, um, to be fair though, if they'd have been 20 pound, they'd have been incredible fish, wouldn't they? Anything from a lake yeah. like that. Yeah, that's it. And, and they're the type of lakes that I like. I've always liked fishing, you know, I always like lakes that are, really give me a lot of pain. So, yeah, but um, the, the spot that you fished there, that you said that you had that off, was it was it a gravel bar? What what sort of what sort of setup you know was what? it? It was just it was the the bottom was terrible. It was you, you couldn't get a drop on it. It mm. was it was all crap on the bottom. All it was it was it was just a hole in the weed, but the right. bottom was weedy still. So yeah. I was using helicopter rigs. I was using helicopters and literally just in the weed. Yeah, which I've done a lot of fishing over the years in the weed and. You know, I think from the days when I fished the tip lake in the 80s, you know, the weed was so bad on the tip, we used to just cast in the weed and catch them. Pop-up? So, Pop-up? No, bottom baits. Bottom baits, bottom baits, bottom in, the baits in the weed with short hairs. You've got to use really short hairs, mm. you know. But I fish like that for years, so I'm confident fishing like that. I've had lots and lots of fish like that, which is a bit different. So I wasn't going for a drop. I was just in a hole. Baited, the hole was baited. Yeah. I mean, I, I reckon after the, after a couple of weeks of putting bait in and yeah, fishing yeah. that spot regular, that probably was all cleaned, cleaned off. Cleaned off, yeah, totally. But yeah, so I'd had a, I'd had a 36 um, mirror and I went and got Darby Dave, who's one of the really old syndicate members on there, real nice fella. He come down, he was well over the moon to see me catch it and it was great, you know, to to catch a, another Savé fish Amazing. on the days. 
Um, and the following week, I went back and I had another two off that spot. The same spot? Yeah, I had another two. I've done the same. I went back the following week, done another couple of days on it. And um, I had uh, the first morning, um, I didn't get nothing. Um, second morning, I had a 38 common, which was an absolute belter. A uh, real beautiful car, which I was so over the moon with, and they were really on me that morning. Mm. I had one rod red lot on the rest left, so it's only allowed two rods on on yeah. season ticket. Yeah, and I had one rod left, and um, John Harry come down. I'd had a thirty eight common, and me and John are talking, you know, and having a cup of tea and that, and they were still fizzing on me. <sighs> they were fizzing all over me. They were, and I still had a rod left out there, and. Um, I said, and it was it was a great touch because um, a couple of the loony wrote had come down that week and photographed the fish for me. I think um, you know Welsh Paul come down, um, Nick Simpkins, um, Lee come down, a few of the loony wrote and and um, I said to them, I'm gonna I'll, if no one moves in here, I'll, I'm coming back yeah, tomorrow. This is me, yeah, because don't forget them guys can move in because I've got to go home. They're they're there. They're, they're yeah. night fishing. And they all said, no, nah, we're not going to move in yeah, here. I was going to say, they wouldn't do that, would they? But, it's quite... Yeah, but they didn't. And uh, and they said to me, no, we're not going to do that. And um, so the next morning, I went straight back again on the gate. I was at six o'clock ready. Yeah. My rig's tied on. Got straight in there. Got the rods back on there, on that spot again. Um, and at uh, 10 o'clock, I caught the trophy fish at 41. What in the world, yeah. Dempsey? And what a, what a battle that was, because uh, uh, I always remember I hooked it, and it come in really easy, and I got it, it come up on the ledge, it's shallow, where I was fishing in a swim called a rat hole, and it's quite shallow, really, in close, and then it sort of drops down a bit. And anyway, as, I, as it come up the ledge, it wasn't fighting that much. Mm. And at one stage, I didn't even know if I had it on. And then all of a sudden, as it come up the ledge, it just went mental. And it done a left and it started heading to Pete's Island, which is down the bank. And it, and I literally had to sort of jump in the lake, like up, up to my knees. It's only shallow there, but get the rod poked right out because yeah. it was just tearing down towards... It really fought hard and was our nervous playing that fish. Oh, mate. I knew because you know one of them ones that fight so hard, yeah. you just know they're going to fall off. Yeah, you're just sitting there thinking it's going to fall off. I'm destined not to catch off. this. It's a yeah. beast. Yeah, I know the feeling. It's not nice. But what a result! And to get the trophy fish, so mate, any fish on there as you say, but there's some incredible captures, mate. So yeah, you, you mentioned there before about the rotors and the fact that on there there are two rotors. There's the loonies and the toads. Now you at this point are just day fishing, aren't you? Yes, but then, at some point, yep, you've got your night ticket. Yeah, haven't yeah. You? Once I've done the thing is with Savé, it's a very fair system on Savé. Yeah. Um, where on um, a lot of lakes, it's either who you know or you've got to go on a long waiting list. What they, the, the generally the rule was always with Peter Brock's up, who was a, always the main man at Savé when I was younger. Uh, he he had the rule that if you put the effort in on a day ticket. You know, and you get on with the other guys on there and, you know, you ain't pulling no strokes, then you're in with a shout of getting a night ticket. So it's yeah. quite fair. So the people who turned up and done their days, they they were in with a shout. And that's what I've done. I went and done my days. You know, I've done all my hard work down there. I caught some fish on day ticket. And, um, gotcha. you know, and then I, I got offered the ticket. And from that point, in terms of obviously now you're still on, you're still on. Well, you're... I am, yes. And I, you know, it's a lake that I wouldn't ever want to drop. No. Um, you know, I, when I first, I didn't know what to do when I got a night ticket. I really, I was like a kid in a sweet shop. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know whether I was breaking a rule or not, you know, yeah. because it get to nine o'clock and I'll be thinking, I should be out of here by now. I like, you know, and it, <laughs> it was one of them. And it was a like nerve wracking going through because. On the days you only allowed certain, um, you, you're only you're only allowed certain banks. You're not allowed the full, no full access. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So all of a sudden, I'm going to parts of the lake that even after all these years that I'd been sort of been a been a part of my life, I'd never seen. What a place, mate! One yeah. day, mate, one day I will do my very best to get on there. I think it's, it's a, hollow turf, yeah, isn't it? You're young enough, aren't you, to do it? You know, <laughs> most of the art. It's a it's a bit of an old boy syndicate. It is so. What a place! So some romance about that place, isn't there? Yep. Another place, which has got equal sort of amounts of romance and history. And we're going back a bit here when we talk about this. Has to be Raysbury. The last time I fished with you. Oh yeah, was it Raysbury? Was it Raysbury? Indeed, mate. Raysbury 
as it is now. But yes. you obviously tackled Raysbury as it was then. Yeah, right. I, f- I first uh, set eyes on Raysbury in the 80s. Um, a massive, big uh, bombshell um, of Raysbury was when Peter Springate done the uh, interview in the Carp Fisher. Yeah. Um, and it sort of blew the lid off of something, some, something massively special. And it, and it opened the world up to to Raysbury to what it was. And the fish that Peter and Kenny Odder were catching were unbelievable. So what happened was, when I was fishing Longfield, I got to know Chris Ball and, and some of the guys who had fished Raysbury. So I got a big um, introduction to Raysbury when I was fishing Longfield. Um, and then years later, um, around 97 or 98, um, I was fishing on the cons and I think there was a, a fish kill or something happened. There was something happened. There was, we, they closed the lake down for a little bit. So I'd lost my cons um, mm. ticket for a while. The lake had closed down and, and um, I think the water level was low. Something had happened. Anyway, I needed a backup water. And so my first option was obviously going to be Raysbury. It was my first, um, you know, because of my history of fishing Longfield and going over Raysbury in the eighties, and um, you know, and and obviously in those days, Raysbury had some of the biggest carp in the country as well. Mary was still in there, um, Mary's mate, and fish like that that really, you know, that was just super special. I mean, when I first went to Raysbury, the big one in there then would have been, or the biggest known fish would have been Olive. Mm. Um, and then Mary was small. Mary was would have been just a scraper twenty. Yeah. I think in the video that I am in with Chris Ball. Um, cause Chris Ball done a video, uh, I'm in it with my 40 out of Longfield. I think clusters in that video and Malins and they're both 20 pounders in like scraper they're 20s. 20 pounders. Wow. So when I caught, um, that thought Jack the net ripper, yeah. Malins was an 18 pounder and so was Mary. So that just relatively shows you that around the time scale. So it was the late nineties when, um, I've got, my Raysbury ticket again. Oh, I got I got my first Raysbury ticket, and I went back over there for the first time um, in years and years and years. And it, and I only walked through the gate, and I'd been there five minutes, and I knew after people there. Yeah, straight straight away, I bumped into Tetley, who I knew from Longfield, and then I bumped into Chile. Um, Jim Shelley was on there at the time. Yeah. It was the first time I met Jim, um, and there were, yeah, there was loads and loads of, of good anglers on there when I first. Um, went on there. How did you feel about that, mate? Because obviously, in all these places, it's, it's similar sort of people. So it's nice on a sort of a, a sort of a friendship, camaraderie level, and, and socials, which we'll no doubt talk about. But in a fishing, catching fish prospect, they're competition, mate, and they're yeah. good anglers. Yeah, and they've got the time, and they're a lot local. So it was a daunting uh, prospect because my life had changed a lot as well. How's that? I wasn't a full-time angler anymore. I had a job. I had a girlfriend. I had my own house. You know, in, in that period from 1990, 90, when I was at Savay and I was living in a field, mm. to 96, 97, when I was fishing the cons and I was getting my first, started getting interested in Sa- um, Raysbury again. Um, I'd changed a lot in my life. I couldn't live how I was living anymore. I'd had enough of living on tomato sauce sandwiches, you know. Was and, that a decision you made? Yeah, I just, it was, well, it was a, it was a, it was a, it, I, I'd come, I'd hit a brick wall. I didn't have hardly any tackle left. My tackle was just worn out. I was using reels with, hard, you know, that were just falling apart. My buzzers were falling apart, my everything. And in those days, there weren't no sponsored anglers. So there weren't no, no. you know, with a fish that I'd caught then, if it was nowadays, I'd have people throwing tackle at me oh, yeah. and bait at me for nothing. But then it wasn't like that at all. So, you know, I didn't have the tackle. My mum had had enough of me not working all year and doing the summers. And to be honest, I think I was a bit burnt out. I was going to say, would you? did you burn out? Yeah. a lot of angling. Yeah, I, I was burnt out totally, you know. And uh, I was getting to that age when I was interested in girls more and stuff, you know. So I was burnt out, totally burnt out. And, um, you know, didn't have the money to sustain yeah. that lifestyle anymore. You know, had enough of living on tomato sauce sandwiches and, and really just sort of. So when I got in, when I joined Raysbury in the nine, late 90s, I was down to one night a week. God, yeah. And what turning, a and that turning is. up at, at Raysbury 
And I think in them days, it was about, I think Tetley told me, I think there was 17 fish in 120 acres when I first fished yeah. on there, you know? Um, so it was, yeah, it was a, it was a big ask. Mate, I looked there. at it, like obviously last time we fought and you think both those lakes, now they're split, but both them joined together, mm. that much water and 17 fish the depths in there, mm. the different topography. It's not like it's just a no, shallow bowl. It's an egg box. It's an absolute, yeah, box of all sorts. Yeah, it's it's massive... not an easy prospect no, at all. Well, it's like four or five lakes, isn't it, really? Oh, mate, you're ridiculous. Four or five big lakes. So, yeah, I fell in love with it, to be honest. I, some of my most enjoyable fishing has been over there, um, really has. Uh, just arriving at the place... Um, and feeling the energy of the lake, you know, the energy, the atmosphere, you could cut it with a knife. It was that sort of, it, it had so much atmosphere, so much energy there. And it really was a special place. And, and what I loved about it was, it was just wild fishing. Yeah. It was, there was no gravel, there was no bark chip swims. There was, it was just so wild, like, you know, it really was. And, you know, it was just like, you. it was an adventure. So a four day session up there for me in them days or, or whatever, if I, if I got a holiday session up there or, you know, the one nighters that I'd done was a, always an adventure. It was always a massive adventure. And to be honest, it was always, a, a, it was a killer. Yeah. You, you do two nights at Raysbury or a night at Raysbury, you feel like you'd been just had a fight with Tyson Fury. You'd come home, you'd be bruised, cut to bits, yeah. you know, just, just getting through the bankside foliage to your swim or to a swim or trying to get to see some fish. You just get cut to bits. It was just so wild, overgrown, lack of fish. Um, it only took me about three nights to hook one. No way. Yeah, yeah. But I think that was a bit of a fluke, to be honest. Um, well, saying that, I, I'd had a good walk around there in the close season and had a good look. And I kept seeing fish down by Sunny Meads yeah. in close. And there was a swim there called the bus stop. And it had a big willow either side of it. I don't know if it's the same nowadays, but it had a big willow hovering either side of it. Anyway, there was a southeasterly wind when I turned up. And it was, I think it was my second, second trip or my third trip. And what I decided to do, because I didn't have a lot of time and I didn't have a boat, I decided to get every, carry everything in a rucksack. So my whole fishing stuff was in a rucksack, but that meant sleeping on the floor. Yeah. So what I had is I had a little roll, a rolled mat that I'd lay on the floor and a little sleeping bag and I'd sleep on the floor <laughs> and just, just chuck a little 45 inch brolly over me, like a little steadfast thing. So anyway, I've gone down to the South Easterly's blown right down into sunny meads on a really warm day. Uh, Marky Mark, who, who died yeah. at Raysbury, him and Jim were sitting in Grassy Point and I went and sat with them for a couple of hours and we were chewing the fat, having a chat. And um, I decided after a couple of hours um, to, to go and fish on in Sunny Meads on the bottom bank. I hadn't seen any fish or nothing. And I, so anyway, I left Jim and Mark, um, walked from the grassy, walked right down to the bus stop and it was just getting dark. And um, I just flicked them in the margins, three rods, <laughs> one down to the right, one down to the left and one in front of me. Load of chopped fish meals that I was using. Uh, 50, 50 fish meal boilies round each rod or whatever. So 150 baits, all the rods in the margin, slackened everything off, set up up the back away from the, the, the edge of the lake and, and slept on the floor. Four o'clock in the morning, half past four in the morning, left arm rods just in meltdown. The butt's up in the air, the tip's touching the water and it's just lying, ripping off the spool. So anyway, I picked the rod up this fish is tearing off down to the left. And anyway, then it's kited down towards the back of that cigar island. Right. Took me into a snag. No. So now I can see this all boiling up, all boiling up in this snag. And um, it's in the snag. There's not a lot I could have done. So anyway, I put the rod on the rest, took the clutch off, and I run all the way to Jim's swim. Now it's a long run from, um, from the bus stop to Grassy Point. It's a long run. And I was knackered by the time I got there. So I told Jim I got one on. Anyway, we rowed across in the boat and the fish had got off. It done milk link. Uh, yeah. But it was later that day that Malins was in the tree and and it was sulking. So it, You reckon it was Malins? Yeah, it was Malins. Yeah, it was Malins. And Malins was hanging around that area all spring. Every time I went there, he was there. And it was one of the reasons that I wanted to fish along their margins because I had seen him 
moving along around the back of that cigar island and that in close. So yeah, that was that. Wow. That was that. And um, that was the only take I had that year. And the following year, I had my first child, my daughter, Nicole. Oh, she's over 20 now, so... Life-changing, mate. Yeah. What so, were you doing for work at this time? You said, yeah, you you were into work. So I, what, I, I was chauffeuring. Chauffeuring? Yeah, I got a job driving up London, and uh, I was chauffeuring. No way. Yeah, yeah. Who's the most famous person you chauffeured for? I think I chauffeured the Pakistan president. Did you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. On the board. I was, I was, um, I have, I've chauffeured a few, uh, few, a few stars in that, but I was working for a family in London as their chauffeur. Right. So I would take their children to school, yeah, take yeah. the wife shopping, take the husband to his business appointments, and they were from Hong Kong. Wow. So, and that was in Regent's Park. That's a different Park. world, isn't it? Yeah, totally. Um, I didn't, I'd done it for a bit, but it was the fishing that got me off of, <laughs> off of the work again, <laughs> as always in my life, um, because I really had to live a regime with these people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to live... Uh, to their to their life. Yeah, it's their life, you know? isn't it? Yeah, totally. So there wasn't no holidays. There wasn't no. I couldn't go. F- and and, I, and I'm, I've always been a bit of a free spirit. So yeah, but yeah. that's what I was doing at the time. So you obviously, birth of your first child. Yeah, your birth of my first child, which put my raspberry fishing on the back burner for a couple of years. Um, was know. that in your head? Was that was that led by? The missus, or did you want to be at home because of your daughter and because yeah, life had changed a I, bit? I wanted to be home because of my daughter, obviously. That's a massive experience. But um, also my wife, you know, at the time, she my girlfriend at the time, she, uh, she, you know, she didn't want me out fishing while we had a new baby. Um, Raysbury was a big, big ask, you know, to, to go on, especially with very limited time, you know, and all the top top anglers are on there doing loads of time and literally yeah. there was people down there for months yeah living in swims and stuff like that so um yeah so that was that and um i went back that year and started fishing the cons again the cons was a bit more friendly it was a little bit more friendly to fish i could turn up at the cons late at night have my rods out within an hour or two raisbury is a mission you had to get there get your boat which was hidden yeah. take it to somewhere else load the boat then go looking you know, yeah. and if you don't know the lake that well, um, you know, it, it could take two days to get your rods in. So instead of two hours at the cons. So, yeah, it wasn't until early 2000 that I went back on so Raysbury. Early 2000. Yeah, so. about early 2000 that I went back on Raysbury. So I missed out a couple of years on there, a couple of three years. And sadly, when I went back, Mary was dead. Mary had died. Yeah. But there was still an handful of prize fishing there like free scales uh mary's mate the pug and malins was still in there yeah you know and i mean it did have a few more fish put in there as well um and they was a bit lot smaller now um the the the, the stockies the sutton ones that got put in by simon scott beautiful fish though yeah but these um these handful of originals that were still left in there so i went back for those around early 2000 Sort of once I once I'd had a bit more time on my hands, um, and I could see that it was a bit more chance of me getting the sessions, getting spots going, and learning the lake. And yeah, and I loved it, absolutely loved it. I went back there and I and I caught some nice fish. I, my first uh, Raysby original was the pug. The pug. Talk that, to me about your capture of the pug. That man. was a brilliant capture. It was just after Marky Mark uh, had died. Um, yeah, so for uh, those that don't know, Marky Mark drowned, didn't he? Yeah, there was yeah. two lads who drowned. Marky Mark and Mark had both drowned, like, you know, bless their hearts, <sighs> um, at the lake. And it was a few months after that. They, that I think they drowned on New Year's Eve. Yeah, I remember um, them, yeah. Yeah, and a um, very sad, tragic thing happened. And, and anyway, this would have been around March. It was around March, and the season ended at the end because Raysbury then had a close season, and it ended at the thirty first of March. Mm. And I went over there. It was a mate of mine fishing it called Stig, and uh, another fella called Perry. Who were two of my mates, who and I've known Perry since I was twelve. Like you know, he's another local East London angler. So anyway, I went down there to see them on this particular day, and I was going to do just a one nighter. Uh, which is a big ask, especially in March, if you ain't seen the lake for a few years. But I was keen. I had all the gear on a barrow as well. I didn't have a boat. And what I decided to do, because but because, because of the drownings, 
because yeah. of the two drownings, the boats the, the, they'd, they'd, they'd halt the boats. Yeah, yeah they'd halt yeah. Them, halt them for a little bit. So anyway, what I've done is um, I walked all the way round from Douglas Lane, no, um, from the route down to Douglas Lane, right round the railway lake, down to Sunnymeads, all the way down to the Style, which is a, anyone who knows that it's a serious walk with a barra. And literally, there's about 50 trees that have fell. So you was under one tree, over oh. another, and this is with a barra. By the time I got round, I'd snapped a rod. Yeah, one of my rods had got caught in a tree and snapped, and it was a total disaster. I'd sweat off of me, and I'd gone right down to Giant's Footsteps, which is a mile's walk from from the route, with a barra. Anyway, when I got down to Giant's Footsteps, I'm standing there looking out at the lake, and it was quite a warm day, but it had been a cold night, a frost night. Yeah. And when I looked down, there was this big common, big fat common, swam past me feet. A massive thing, good mid-30, easy. And then when I was standing, I was like, oh, my God, what is that? So anyway, then all of a sudden, another fish has come in, a mirror, which I think was three scales. So now my heart's pumping, yeah, pumping, um, pumping. Yeah. Anyway, right in the margins, there was a tyre on the bottom. It was a tyre right down. It was about seven foot deep, and it was a tyre. And next to it was a few bits of gravel and some silt. So I chopped up a few of my fish mills, and I threw them down there. I walked further down the bank and there was another spot as well that I could see. So I chopped a few fish mills up and threw a bait on that and all. Anyway, about half hour later, I went and checked the first one that I'd baited and all the bait had gone down by the tyre. So it was I'd literally had to open up these brambles completely um, and I had to strap them back so I could get a rod in place. Anyway, I put one rod, lowered it with a fish mill on the end with about sort of, I don't know, 10 in- I think amnesia hook link about 10 inches of yeah. amnesia a hard bait big lead just lowered it off the tip next to this tyre you know on this bit of gravel threw a load of bits of bait around it and sat there waiting anyway it got till late at night and nothing could happen and I phoned up Perry who was still in the um, and he was packing up he was in the route and I said to him I've seen a fish I've seen a common and I think I've seen free scales and he's like you're joking and I went nah because I haven't seen a fish all winter they've been down there all winter like and they just started seeing the odd fish. So anyway, next morning, I got a one toner off this rod, off this margin rod. I just hear, Wee! <laughs> Delkin's just ripping, like, you know. So anyway, I've gone running up. The fish had gone under a tree trunk to me left and now was wallowing around out in the lake oh. about 20 yards out. So I thought, oh, I ain't got a chance of getting this one. So I've had to get, me other, get another rod set up, cast it over the yeah. line and then I've had to start handlining it because what had happened, where it had the take, it had run under a tree branch down to me left, and now it's going out into the lake. Yeah, so you're trying to get the so line I, off it. So I don't want to pull it into the snag. Yeah. If I start pulling this fish, all I'm going to do is pull it straight into a snag. So what I've done is I cast my other line over it, caught the line, got that, and started to tie two back together, two lines back together with my heart beating fast, thinking, my God, I've got this big fish on the end, you know. Anyway, I'm carrying on playing it, and now I'm I'm, like, I'm really, really, you know, my heart's pounding wherever I'm yeah. going to get it, and all of a sudden I fell in. I slipped, I slipped down into the lake. and um, How deep is it? It is. It was seven foot oh, where the tyre was. God. So it's, it's, and it, it's, it's like a steep, big drop. So yeah. anyway, now I'm in the lake, yeah, with my clothes on. I've let go of the rod and the fish. I don't care about that anymore. Now I'm trying to survive. survive yeah. yeah. The water's freezing. It's March. And I'm grabbing these rocks and I'm trying to drag myself out of the lake and I can't get out. Every time I'm grabbing something, it's just pulling off. So anyway, in the end, I've made it. I've dragged myself out. I've grabbed some grass or some brambles and I've dragged myself out of the lake. Anyway, I've got my got back into the fish. And next thing, I had it in the net. Where was the rod? Did you just... yeah, it was just on the floor. Which... And the line, I just, all the line I had to drop. And I, and I just picked it all back up. And the fish was on it. It was just wallowing around on the surface. Oh, my God, that is. You know? When your name's on it, your yeah, name's your on name's it, Yeah, your name's on it. Anyway, I, I've got it in the net. And it's this big common, big, deep, really dark common. Beautiful. And there's a guy who used to fish Longfield with me, Ginger Steve, who used to fish Yately as well. And uh, he only lived just up the road from Raysbury. And I didn't want to tell anyone because I wanted to keep it pretty quiet about my capture. Yeah. And I knew Steve wouldn't tell no one. So I phoned Steve. Steve come down, done the photos. Anyway, about two days later, I, 
I managed to get another overnighter down there two or three days later. And I went down there and I walked all, went all over the lake and I found two fish in the finger base. Yeah. Two mirrors. And, um, I had a boat that trip. They let us use, they let the boats back on. Back on. Yeah. They let, they let us use boats again. So what I've done is I had this big rowing boat and I rowed out. I see these two fish in the finger bays and I rowed out and there was a bar about 20, 30 yards short of where these two fish were just basking just below the surface. Anyway, I chopped a load of fish mills up, put it on the bar, load a rod on the bar. Again, bit of amnesia, rowed back to the bank and uh, put my rod on the rest. Me other rod, put it down in the edge under me tip. Anyway, about two in the morning, there was a lad fishing in um, in the North Lake called Daryl, um, one of Jim's mates, and he was sitting with me. And we could see these fish still milling around out the back. So they were around. And about one in the morning, I heard a massive crash over my rod, right over the top of my rod. And it was a big crash. And at three in the morning, it ripped that oh. rod on the bar. And I had an epic battle, absolutely pulling like an horse's thing. And, and it was it was going on the surface and thrashing and all that, you know, it's the noise. Anyway, I got it in the net and straight away, I knew it was a pug. I could oh, just see what such a fish, a mate. Absolute belting carp. That is a proper history fish, mate, yeah. isn't it? And the pug was one of the hardest ones to catch and all. Like, at the... Yeah. The, all the guys said, like, you know, the, the friendly fish in the lake, you know, the Marys and the Malins would get caught regular, but the pug was was a very rare one. So, yeah, to catch a pug, over 40 as well. Was it? Mm. What a period of time yeah, that is, mate. Yeah. What a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah, that was all in the same week. So, that was brilliant. But... um. I really was on a roll and I was thinking, do you know what? I'm going to clear up here. Um, Cause I was on, I was on fire and I had a little bit of time for the foot for the first time ever. I've had a bit of time on my hands. So what's changed here to give you a bit of time? Well, my missus kicked me out. <laughs> That's changed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cause of my fishing exploits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was single again. And um, so you, you basically single chauffeur in, you've gone, yeah, nah, forget that. So, I'm going fishing. Yeah. Yeah. So I started doing a bit more fishing and then I started to have, <laughs> I started selling clothing. I was um, selling, I was selling clothing and um, I was selling clothing to a lot of fishing companies. Well, yeah, yeah, I was, I was um, doing all, I was getting, I was importing them from the far East. Yeah. Uh, and um, <clears throat> you know, Heathrow bait services, like yeah, Ian Russell, good, good old Russell. <clears throat> Gardner Tackle, yeah. you know, Lockie. And, you know, I went down to call the, you know, HQ and, and see Damo and that down there. And this was, I was, you know, I was doing a lot of clothing and also I was doing a lot of clothing, not just for fishing. I was doing a lot for sports as well. Right. Football and, and that. So I was doing that with someone else at the time, but it was where it was my own business. I was getting a bit more time. Of course. Yeah. I was a bit more free. And so I started to do a bit on Raysbury, but then, um, I think it was my next, it's about a week, couple of weeks after I had the pug. Um, I went down there in my dad's car because I was working with my dad at the time and he had a, he had a Mondeo and what I was doing, I was going out and baiting up this spot out in the uh, Dredger Bay. And while I was out, out there, I heard a bang oh, no. and uh, they shot all my dad's windows out. Yeah. It, it, which is what I was going to come to, to talk to you about is Raysby was pretty infamous, not for just being inhospitable with regards to, the fishing and it being pretty savage getting around and, and trying to catch something, but also because of the, yeah, goings on, shenanigans, general safety yeah. while you're out there. It was pretty bad, wasn't it, mate? What it, are some of your memories of all that stuff? It was in the middle of, Raysbury was pretty much in the middle of a, quite a lot of council estates and there was a lot of travelling families and stuff like that around there as well. So well, Douglas Lane still to this day is, yeah. is a big site, isn't it? That's it, yeah. So, um, there was that there. So we always knew you had to be careful. What some of the guys used to do down there was leave their car doors open, literally, and all their windows open because they knew that then people ain't going to do their cars. Mm. And it was like that. And we did. We had a period of time where we was getting our cars done. I had mine, my dad's car done. I mean, my poor dad, I had to go and pick him up and he had no windows in his car. So he weren't so happy. <laughs> what did he say to that? <laughs> he, just, he just didn't know what to say. <laughs> So, and then the following, um, I, I didn't fish it much again that year because of having my car done uh, and a couple of other things happened. And I think we was getting shot at quite a lot over there. there was shot kids, at. Yeah, it was kids walking around with air rifles, shooting at our bivvies and all that. So 
I pulled off again for a little while. You've said that pretty blase, mate. That's pretty, um, yeah, well, that's you, not the you, one, is you it? You got used to it over there. It was one of them. I mean, we was over there one day and three kids come past on a sofa and they had it using it as a boat. Do you know what I mean? That was the sort of place. And on a hot, the hot, it was when it was a hot, they all used to come to the lake yeah. and they'd all go swimming out in the lake. And they used to swim over to the sailing club and, and nick all the sailing boards. And all and, and then the sailing club guy used to come around the next day and ask us if we're all the sailing balls because they'd be spread all over. Yeah. They wouldn't nick them. They'd just float around in them all day. No, it's just playing, a float, isn't it? Just yeah. doing dive bombs off them and that, you know? <laughs> Sounds all right. Yeah, so <laughs> Man. It, it was a crazy place. And then the follow and then I didn't go back I went on Sutton after that, funny yeah. enough, for the rest of the year. I went on Sutton. Um I had a Sutton ticket and I thought I fish somewhere like Sutton. It's a, you know, and because Raysbury was a, just a joke, you know, I didn't want to lose my tackle. And then, but then the following spring, I went over Raysbury again because I really wanted to catch Mary's mate and Malins. They were my two target fish after catching the park. I really wanted to get one of them. And, um, my first trip back, um, I had a whole week. I was going to do a whole nice. week. And um, it was a really good time of the year and all. I think it was like start of April. But my first night at a session, I was just going to get sank out of my car and I had the whole lot of my, my tackle stolen. No, they've done yeah, you. done the whole lot of my tackle, yeah. So that was... Um, yeah, that's pants. Yeah, that was horrible. And it was... They really wiped me out as well. Like, they took everything. They didn't leave nothing. Even my rucksack with everything. All my tackle boxes, all my cameras, everything. I lost oh, the whole man. lot. The only thing they never took, they couldn't get my bed chair out underneath my brolly because they couldn't get the storm poles out because I pushed them in too deep. Right. But everything else got took. So, again, that stalled me. I kept getting stalled. Um, and then I went and lent a lot of tackle off of people. I borrowed tackle. Um, I had three rods off some once. Uh, Johnny Miller bought me three reels. You know, it was really kind of oh, him. You yeah, know, and a, lot of, a lot of good people turned up who had heard I'd had my tackle stolen and they'll come and help me you know they really yeah. did and, and and some of the lads give me bits and pieces and and everything and, but what they all said to me was is do not take it to Raysbury you know because it's going to go missing again and and what I've done I've done the rest of that week session yeah on um we've all lent tap borrow tackle on Johnson's railway lake <laughs> And on the sixth day, I caught the barbless common. <laughs> yeah. 36 That's and a half. Though, isn't it? Yes, I, a 36 and a half, which was a personal best common for me at the time. It was a brilliant fish to catch out of, and again, another really tough lake. That is calm, so the carp gods, mate. It had gone from having this all my tackle stolen yeah. to everyone saying, I've, he's got a week off work, come on, let's all round up your tackle. I rounded up a load more tackle. I remember, and I was Dan Johnson's fishing, and I had twigs as bobbins. I remember because <laughs> my tackle was very bare. I don't yeah, have minimal. anything. Yeah, exactly. And uh, but yeah, on the sixth day, I caught uh, the barbless common. Oh, you deserve that, mate, for the absolute term all this Raysbury. And then two weeks later, I went back to Raysbury and caught my, Mary's mate. Oh, yeah. Mary's mate, give me the story, mate. Come on. Yeah, Mary's mate. Um, I remember turning up. I spoke to Tetley on the phone, and he said to me he had a walk round there with his dog during the day. And Bryant's Bay was full of fish. He said, there's fish everywhere, and that's rare for Raysbury. Yeah. So I'm now, I've gone from 50 mile an hour on the M25 to 70 mile, 80 mile, whatever, 60 mile an hour to 80 mile an hour, you know. I really wanted to get in Bryant's Bay. Mm. Really wanted to get there, and I flew down there. And um, when I got there, um, I was standing in Bryant's Bay, and there was someone there already. Daryl, no. yeah, Daryl had a rod in the bushes. I couldn't even see it. It was down in the edge. He had a rod there and he'd been watching the fish as well. So I couldn't fish there, but I'd been baiting the finger bays all close season. I'd been going down there and putting bait in the finger bays. After catching the pug there the previous years, I realised that, you know, that there's an area they liked a lot and it didn't get that much pressure. What were you putting in? Just boily again? Uh, boily, pellet, particle, mix, yeah. you know, like I do. Um... So I was going down there every week and putting a bucket on a spot, you know, or a couple of buckets. So I had a couple of good inkling areas. And I had one little bit where there's a stalking area, real close in bit, you know, and uh, and that's how I caught Mary's mate. I, I, it was in the evening um, and I was I had a one rod, little one rod bit, where there's a little stalking bit. I had a little one rod bit. And measles come into the swim. Oh, yeah. And measles was there. And measles come down and she picked up a couple of baits and went off. 
And I thought, in the morning, I'm going to catch that fish. That's going to come back tomorrow, and I'm going to catch him. Next time, he's going to be more keen, you know? Yeah. And so what I've done is, first thing in the morning, first light, I got in this little spot stalking bit and sitting there waiting for measles to turn up. You know, one rod, just one little eight-foot rod or whatever it was, little eight, nine-foot stalking rod. And um, I took my kettle with me and my coffee, and the rod was laying on the floor next to me, and I was just fishing, like rod length out yeah. in this in this little hole and all of a sudden I just see me tip just go what right over and just line just start peeling off the reel light and I oh. picked it up anyway I was playing this fish and it was quite dark because it was you know it was early in the morning so the sun hadn't come up properly and um, anyway this big fish has rolled over by the net and I've netted it and straight away I thought it was king fungus yeah because that king fungus was around at the time and it hadn't been caught much and that's a really long fish yeah. with scales but then it, um, something that I'll never, ever forget, when I looked in the net, Mary's mate tensed up. It was Mary's mate and she tensed up and she looked like a big plated, like, oh, it was just a warrior of a fish, all these massive plates and where she was so tense. So seeing that in the net was oh. unbelievable. So I knew straight away it was Mary's mate. Well, I don't even know what to say to that, mate. That's just incredible, isn't it? And um, to, I thought it was measles, obviously. And then I thought it was fungus. And then it was Mary's mate. Uh, anyone would have done. Do you know yeah, what I mean? But that was the one I wanted, Mary's mate. What above a them fish. All. Yeah, above them all. Ooh. So, yeah, that was a, a massive a massive morning What did you me. go when you, have it, when you had it? Uh, it was 42 and a half. Wow, mate. Yeah, And um, Tetley and Alan Taylor come over in the morning to do the photos uh, a couple of the other lads who were, who were fishing up there, they come down as well. And yeah, it was a big day. I missed work that day. I bet you did. Yeah, I got a bollocking as well. I bet you missed <laughs> work for the rest of the week, mate. Yeah, the whole social yeah. scene was pretty good on oh, there when somebody so... caught one, wasn't it? Where are you today? You've got this to do. Oh, I'm, I'm nowhere Ill. today. I'm really yeah, Ill. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I got home about two in the afternoon. I was supposed to be home at first, early, nine o'clock. What a fish, mate. Mm, yeah. Mate, incredible. And then for, in terms of the rest of your time on Raysbury, how did that chapter come to a close? Well, it was funny because I kept getting stalled, like things that happen, mm. cars that get broken into, things that happen that always push me off. So it was really weird that I got pushed off again. Um, that year, I think it was that year, I got a ticket for the Waltonians. Yeah. My Waltonians ticket come up which was a mega lake, which was like, he just, you know, was the ultimate lake in them days. If anyone ever read Rob Malin's book, Tiger Bay, mm. it was pretty much all about the Waltonians. So when I got my Waltonians ticket, I think I had to put Raysbury on the back burner because there was a couple of old warriors in the Waltonians, like Tyson and Dearman's mate, yeah. that I really had to fish for. And it wasn't until 2012 that I went back to Raysbury. And started fishing it again. And then nearly all the originals had gone. Yeah, I was going to say, what was all left? All that was left was Jacko's, Floppy Tail Common, I think, was still in there. Jack And Freescale was the only mirror left. But the wow. mirror I was after was King Fungus. King Fungus, yeah. Because my mate, my best mate Tony, who I went to school with, he caught it at 46. Because he yeah. was fishing it with me as well. He caught a lot of them out of there as well. What a fish. And so my last fish out of Raysbury was a £34 Common. Um, one of the old red mines out, red and, comes, out and yeah. all flake, yeah, stalked and all. So that would have been my last fish out of there, and that would have been the last year that Raysbury was as it was. Yeah, before so you, Semex folded. Yeah, so you you then pulled off Raysbury when RK came in. Yeah, well, as soon as RK came in, obviously, you know, the lake was a different lake to when I first fished it anyway in the late nineties. Yeah, um, and a lot of the mirrors, so. When RK came along and um, there was going to be a lot of change um, at the time, I, I decided to to move off. But what I did do around that time was when I wrote my book, Urban Myth. Mm. So when I wrote my book, um, when I was, do I was doing a lot of slideshows around the country and I met a lot of people and I learned a lot about some different lakes and, you know, some ones that are a bit off the beaten track. And that's when I heard about Wingham down in Kent. Um, Rush Widgington told me about it. It's funny you should talk about slideshows, mate. Eric Zanglin, slideshow. Yeah. Very young, impressionable me was there, mate. I remember listening to that slideshow. Was thinking, you there, was you? Yeah, mate. That was, 
I can't even remember what year that was, but I was there, mate. One of my good mates I used to fish with, fished down at Ringstead. Um, he didn't fish at Ringstead. He fished um, down at Stanick with me, yeah. Stanick Lakes. He um, he went up there and he's like, come down, Terry Dempsey's doing a slideshow. I came mm. up, mate. Yeah. It was mega. I think somebody filmed it for YouTube and yes. put it on YouTube later. Yes. But I, I was there, mate. I was young, mate. Yeah. I couldn't have been very Richard. old. But I was yeah, like, what yeah. an absolute boy. Yeah. And I really... I mean, I knew of you, but I hadn't like seen you or done anything. But I remember listening to that and then your book, because it was all in the lead up to writing this and you were saying that, and your book being released, pretty similar time to Kev's, wasn't it? Your yeah, book? yeah, yeah, I think it was. And your, well, your book now, it's going for like 200 odd quid on eBay, mate. The old Urban Myth. That was, um, that was an awesome book. Mate. Yeah, yeah. I sold out. That went really well to the Urban Myth book. What was it like writing a book for you? <laughs> Do you know, I enjoyed it because I'm a bit like, I've got a bit of a creative brain. My brain's a yeah. bit different. I'm a little bit, certain things that I, I can't do, what normal people can do. And there's other stuff that I can do. And one of the things that I can do is tell a story. Yeah, so too right. Where I can tell a story. And I had the t- stories to tell. I think if you haven't got a story to tell, then it's going to be hard to write a book. Yeah. But if you've got the stories to tell, it's easy. And because of the places that I'd fished and the era that I'd grown up in, yeah. and the fishing was so different to what it is now, the stories are just totally one off. You'll never ever they'll never be repeated. What What about the process of writing a book? Did you find it easy to? Because you, you can tell a story. I love tell it. a story in the written word. It's hard, yeah. Mate, I feel I absolutely loved it. I really enjoyed it. Um, what I'd done is it was like a it was like a sculpture to me so I would write a thousand words about my story and then I would go over it again and again and again and one of my mates who wrote a chapter in my book Tim Pot yeah he's a good mate of mine and me and him you spent hours and hours on the phone and I would talk him through it and he would just he loved it you know so we would you know and he, he was doing his one and we'd buzz off each other you know so I, I got a bit of help like that but my writing skills um, started off, you know, not brilliant, but yeah. with writing, you have to keep going in and carving bit by bit by bit. So you will write it and then you'll go back over it again. You might have to go over it six or seven times and then twist it and turn it to get it how you want it. And I really did enjoy that bit. Mm. And the stories, like bringing up all the stories, then I'd get in contact with some of the guys who were fishing with me at the time to for some of their photos and some of the rem- things that they remembered as well. So that would bringing all that together was a brilliant thing, you know. I really, really enjoyed it, and then it all sort of come together because we didn't go with what usually happens with a publisher. We published it ourselves. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Um, Tim Potts' dad worked in a, a in print, so yeah. it, Roy is a lovely guy. He really helped us um, get all the book, you know, get it printed and published and stuff like that. Um, um, there's a lady we knew who worked for the Times. She print, re- um, she proofread, proofread it for it, me. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, and that was it. It all come together. We advertised it ourselves. How long did it take you in total from first sort of... I reckon it took about a year. That's pretty quick, isn't yeah, it, really? I was doing it a lot. I had a lot of time to do it. But you, was, you, as you said, you enjoyed the process yeah, as well. I was doing it all the time and loved it, you know. And I could do like a 10,000 word chapter pretty quick, but then I'd have to keep going over it and over it and over it and over it. You've got to be immensely proud of that, mate. Yeah, you? yeah. And it was, um, it, it was a bit of a gamble because obviously there's a lot of books coming out. Um, I, I hadn't advertised none of my fish. I mean, it was a little yeah. bit different to... You, you were know, proper low key. A lot of the other anglers. I mean, I'd you know, I'd caught a lot of big fish, but I'd never publicised any of them. I'd never been in any mags or that as much, you know, as much as some of the other guys. So I was a little bit nervous, thinking it it might not work that well, but it did. It went really well. I think I printed three and a half thousand copies, and I sold them all out within about eighteen months. It's time for it's time for a second run, mate. Yeah. Well, I've got um. Yeah. I'm. I'm. What I'm gonna do. Is I'm gonna I've, I'm gonna bring out a new book. Oh, that's on. that's what I'll be doing, and that's what I promised everybody when I first done it because I couldn't fit all my stuff in one book. A lot of my chapters, I said it's gonna be over in it's gonna be two books. It has to be two books. So, so the second book, you you're in the process of writing it. Yeah, a lot of it's a lot of it was done then because obviously right. I couldn't fit it into the urban myth. Yeah, yeah, too much. So obviously I'm gonna have to restructure it. And now there's going to be other chapters. Yeah. You know, like some bits from Wingham and Chat Savay and, you know, some of the stuff that I've done a bit 
since then, you know. Exciting, mate. I look forward to that second book. Mate. Yeah, that, that, that'll, that'll go well, I'm sure. Well, mate, that, if it's the first one, and if it's so by, mate. And what I, what I, the reason I didn't want to reprint my first book is because a lot of people, you know, a, a book is, um, I've spoken to other guys who have wrote books and, you know, if a book does sell out and it, it's, it becomes a bit of a collector's item. Yeah. Where I didn't want a book where I've done so many copies, you see it in a jumble sale yeah. for three quid, you know. So I wanted to keep it um, at the right amount. And it was a bit of a gamble. But looking back now, I could have sold a lot more, I'm sure. The financial <laughs> advisor's going, you should have done more. But yeah. the romantic carper has yeah. said you've done exactly the right thing. I that's think you it, have, mate. And that's why I won't reprint it. Yeah. And, and if I ever did reprint uh, the myth, it'd have that extra chapters. And I, w- I wouldn't do it because I think it's, it is what it is. It. Yeah, exactly. yeah, too right. You know? Yeah, I respect that massively, mate. Um, you, you sort of hinted there about Wingham. And that's probably one of the closing chapters I've got, because that's pretty recent. Yeah. Wingham, Wing, you on there. Wingham was a, is a first, I'd say the first modern type of fishery that yeah. I'd ever fished for. Um, people talk about imported fish and stuff like that. Now, my original fishing would have been done at Durham, Longfield, Hainault, which have all been imports. Yeah. Because they were the leanies that yeah, were yeah. coming over and they were all coming over like my Waltonians fisher. They were Belgium. You know, a lot of them were coming over from Germany, from Belgium, from Holland. So my original, in the 80s, most of the carp were all imported when they were really small, when they were fingerlings and grown on into lakes. Then as, then it all changed. So you're not allowed to import fish. So a lot of the fish were being bred in this country. Yeah. Uh, Wingham, um, the fish were bred by a guy called Ken Crow. Now, I'd heard of Ken Crow before because I fished the Waltonians and I'd caught a big Ken Crow fish mm. out of the Waltonians. So I knew sort of the real top quality fish. And then I'd heard about this place called Wingham's in Kent, which was on a nature reserve. Um, and it was in a zoo. It was right next to a zoo. Um, so it was in the middle of a nature reserve. It's next to a zoo. It's in a, absolutely in the middle of nowhere. It's the most quietest place you've ever heard. If you, you you turn your car engine off, you open the door and you hear silence. Wow. And I just love that. You know, that's How to big me. a sheet of water, mate? Well, there was two lakes there. Oh, okay. Originally, I wanted to fish the bigger one of the two, uh, which was a pretty much unknown quantity in there. And it was about 50 acres. But the owner only let you fish it for tench. And you had to use rods under two and a half pound test curve. So it was a tench lake. This was the big one. Where the small lake was the carp lake. But the carp lake had fish to, at the time, around 48 pounds. And the main lake, which was the tench lake, had carp to around 45 pound. So they were both good lakes. Anyway, I ended up ended up having to fish the smaller of the two, yeah. which was around 16 acres. Um, <clears throat> obviously, then it was Tench fishing on the other one. So, But what my plan was, was to do a little bit on here, because he said, if, if you're doing a bit of time, he lets the odd person go on to the Tench Lake and carp fishes now and then, you know. Right. So I had that sort of in the back of my mind. But what an amazing lake that was, that Wingham. I mean, my first trip down there, I didn't really know what to expect I didn't know much about it. I'd only heard about it through my mate called Russ, who I'd known for years down the cons. He'd told me, and obviously the owner, Steve Burke, he'd told me a few bits and pieces, but I didn't really know what to expect. So my first trip down there, I didn't see a fish. End of March, didn't see nothing at all. And, you know, it looked pretty grim. In fact, I think I landed about four tufties. The tufties were all over me. It was a bit of a nightmare trip. But the second trip was middle of April and the weather was warm and I found a big group of fish on the back of an island on a shallow plateau and that I could just see all these dark shapes. It was just like saying, it was a, it was what you dream of all your life <laughs> yeah, yeah. to just bump into this gang of big fish on this shallow bay, you know, <clears throat> and literally I chucked a rod out there in amongst them, put about 30, 40 baits out there. I thought I'm definitely going to spook them, but I had to do it. Yeah. You know, and the other rod went down in the margins and literally about two hours later, I had a 33 common. That was my first one. 33 common. And by the end of that trip, I'd had five. 
Five? Yeah, five fish. So what way? Uh, the, that was the biggest, 33, 33. but I had three 30s, oh. I think, and two 20s. Welcome. Welcome to the And lake. then my next trip, I call, um there was a fish in there that was an absolute belter, and it was like a mismatch common. So one side of it looked like a fully scowled. Yeah. All the sp- and it was a 40 as well. And Ooh. I caught that next trip, 42 and a half. And I was just on a run. Um, what I, what bait? What was, rigs? What was it? Pretty simple? When I, when I went over there, they sort of all said to me, oh, it's all particles, buckets yeah. of particles, plastic corn over the top. I just went in with nutcracker, 22 mil. Big uns. 20, the 22 opposite. mil. Big throwing stick. One of those big sort of called the throwing sticks, the big uns. Yeah. Absolutely filled it in with one of them. And I was going down there, five key bag, boom, 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 out in the middle. And uh, I was, was just working for me. And I, just what, had, simple bottom bait over the top? Yeah, no, I was using cork ball pop-ups. Yeah, okay. Um, on a multi-rig, and I was meshing them, putting women's tights on and meshing them yeah. in tights. So they, so they, because of coots and that. But I had a brilliant season that year. I think I hooked 40 fish in all. Um, and, I, and I had to take like 15 30s and four forties. Wow. And they were some belters as well. I beat my personal best common twice that year. Um, my personal best common was 40 pan, 10 ounce, I think, out of uh, the cons um, many years ago. And then I caught a 44 that year out of Wingham. But I eventually caught that fish the following year at 51 and a half. They were growing like mad. A year later? Yeah, yeah. I'd caught him spawned out at okay. 43 or 44. Right. Um, I had a real hit of fish. I found I blanked. I blanked. It slowed down for me, and I, I, I blanked a couple of times. And then I went over there. I was only doing one night a week. That's all I was doing. That's incredible. One night a week, and I went down there this trip, and um, I found I, went, I, I climbed out into this little willow, and there was a couple of fish tailing up under the willow. So I got a couple of rods up against the willow, and it just started kicking off for me. And I, I just I think I hooked ten in a couple of days. Oh my days! Yeah, I th- I was doing so well. Even Carp TV turned up. I was having really Joe, yeah, Joe, Joe come down. Yeah, Joe turned up. It was a funny one because Joe said to me, he'd heard about the fish that I'd caught the week before. Yeah. I'd had a right hit. I'd had a 39, a 44, and a 35, or I'd had a hit, a really good fish. And Joe said, God, can't we get some of them on camera? So I phoned up the owner and I said, Do you mind if I bring down Joe when he's camera? And he went, Yeah, fine, bring him down. Right. Anyway, he was supposed to be there at eight o'clock in the morning, yeah. And uh, he didn't turn up. So, and I won in the net. I had a 30 pound linear in the oh. net, a stunner. And I phoned Joe up and he went, oh, I ain't come up. He said, I'm still in Colchester. I'm leaving now. So I phoned the owner up and I said, look, Joe's on his way. I've got a 30 pound linear here. And the owner went, put it back. He said, Terry, he said, the fish you're catching out of there, you'll have another one in, a, in an hour or two. Anyway, Joe come down. He sat there for three days and never had another fish. <laughs> <laughs> classic, isn't it? Absolutely we had all classic. the cameras set up and everything. I think we hooked a couple and we just had disasters. It was a disaster. But then the following year, Joe come down again and I said to him, because we tried again, we thought, right, we try again the following year and I had a 49 common for cameras. What year is this, mate? Yeah. TV, what year are we talking? Um, When I had the 49 common, that was, I think it was, no, 2016. Okay, yeah. 2015 or something like that. Yeah, because Joe turned, just as... I had, I'd been there for two, I said to him, come in two days. Cause what was happening was I was going there, yeah. piling the bait in, I was putting out with a throwing stick, putting out three rods with corkball pop-ups on them, leaving them out there for two, two days at a time. I was doing two nights every other week. Yeah. I was leaving them out there for 48 hours. And it was on the last morning when I was getting me fish. Yeah. So they were spooking and then they were coming, coming in back. on the last morning. Anyway, I said to Joe, I'm getting there on a Monday. If you get there on a Wednesday, there's a good chance I'm going to have one that day. You know? And that's oh, what happened. Gosh. He turned up and um, I'd had 17 coat bites. <laughs> yeah. I think I, yeah, I'd had 17 coat bites. I remember it. You know, I'd been picked up so many times. And and what had happened is I was fishing on this plateau out in the middle. Yeah. But the coots were picking me up so much. My rods were in totally different places to where I'd cast. They just dragged them. They're just dropping them everywhere. Oh. But because I was fishing on, um, I was using it. helicopter. Oh, right. I was using it. So your lead don't come off with yeah. the coots because there's so many coots on there. It's a joke. It's a nature reserve. And I was using mesh. So it wasn't, and I was screwing them on into cork. Yeah. So they were staying on. Anyway, this, this, I must have had 
yeah, I, I think I remember saying it was 17 coot bites on this rod. And all of a sudden I was sitting there and I did it, did it, did it, did And I thought another coot, as always, I looked round and the rod was arced over in the rest at full test curve. And the water was just erupting out in the middle. And this fish took about 80 yards of line Ooh. off me. Went through, um, who was it who was fishing next to me? Is it is it Thomas uh, Dunlop? Yeah, not yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, Thomas Dunlop. He was fishing next to me. And straight it, through his straight lines. Straight through his lines. Anyway, I'm shouting to him. And it was a 49-12 wow. mirror. And it never had a name. And I think they named it after me. It's called Tells Common. Oh, wicked. Yeah, and Joe was there. So I've, and, I've, I take, what a fish and all. Nice. It was an absolute belter. I mean, I had a run. I had three commons. Um, I wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't getting amongst, I'd, I'd caught a lot of the fish out of there, but I hadn't had the, the, the two biggest yeah. in there. And then I had a run. I had the 51, 10 common. Then I had the 49 common. And then I capped it with the big common at 53, 14. Which is, which, because they're all big commons, which is the fish where you with your lad? That's the big common. That's the 53, 14. That I think is the most ridiculous, ridiculous photo I cherish that if yeah. I, you know what I mean yeah. what a moment to have your yeah. lad there that was my f- and that was him who caught that fish in my opinion because he I, that was the first night I ever took him fishing for a whole night the, oh my yeah it was the first night and he and he was only about six and he was such hard work he was yeah. throwing rocks in my swim constantly and I was fishing close in I was I was fishing in the uh, um in the helipad, a swim called the helipad. It's a big swim and there's a bay to your right. It's really shallow and the fish get in there. Yeah. And I was all baited, all quiet, waiting for him to turn up and ambush them in this bay. And my son's just throwing rocks in the lake <laughs> and he's spearing stuff and he's, oh, no. he's got my spod rod and he's throwing the spot in the lake. And after 24 hours, I'd had a total nuff. Yeah. And you know what I've done? I've got, two single baits and cast them as far away from my swim as possible. Yeah. I cast them two swims, Dan, two swims away. Yeah. You know, on a, on a, and I cast them to this plateau about 110 yards away in another, someone else's swim. There was no one fishing there, but it was yeah. another swim just to keep it away from him. Yeah. Cause, cause of the disturbance. The disturbance. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, um, it's a tr- it's, it's absolutely true. He said to me, Dad, I'm going to write a note to the fish because you're obviously a rubbish fisherman. You know, we've been here all this time. I'm going to write a note. And we wrote a note to the fish, a, um, an invitation. Right. We wrote an invitation to the carp and we put them on our on the bank sticks, anything to keep him quiet. Yeah, I going to say, kept him occupied You know, it just absolutely wrecked my swim. <laughs> and about an hour later, the, it ripped off. Oh, man. And it was the fish that I've been after the whole time. What was that fight like? It was a really it come in quite easy to be honest, yeah. and then when it got in close, I see what fish it was. Then it woke up and battled, and my son was there with a net. He was like, "Dad, I'll net it." And I just grabbed him, chucked him in the stinging nettles, and he looked up. He went, "What'd you do that for?" He was in a load of stinging nettles. I said, "You stay there." I don't care, lad, who you are. Yeah, Get out my oh, I've way. never chucked him like that in his life. I just picked him up and threw him. Like <laughs> that is a belter, but. For a 53 but I'm coming, oh, we'd probably yeah. all do it. I've just done three years for the fish or two or three years because I even, I wanted to catch that fish so much, I even had a picture of it in my on my wall that when someone else had caught it, someone I didn't even know. Yeah. Someone had shown me a picture. I went, come print that off. I want it on my wall so I can look at it. And What a fish, mate. Yeah, it's, a, it's an absolute belt. I guess going off a 60 pound now, that common. And it don't come, I don't think well, it come out last season. As a place, I think Wingham was probably brought to the, yeah, everyone's forefront with that that eighty odd pounder, the old sporting band, that yeah, was British record or not, whatever the whole scene was. But yeah, mate, there's some there's some big fish in there, mate. Isn't oh there? yeah, yeah, it's amazing. And growing, as you say, I was uh, it was up. I mean, I, I pulled off there in the end. There was still one or two fish that I wanted to catch, but I was getting loads of repeat captures. Yeah, and um, the last night I done on there, I caught two. I think I caught a, a beautiful, fully scaled about thirty one, and I'd caught it three times. And I just thought, you know what, it's time. There's so many good lakes out here that I've got access to. And, time to um, go. Yeah, that's it. Time to move on. A chapter we've got to talk about um, before the end is urban baits, mate. And you're yes. starting that. So you said previously when we were talking about your book and we we're talking about the slideshow at Eric's and, and the slideshows you did, you were pretty underground, mate. To be fair, yeah. And then you sort of came to to sort of publicise your captures. And then you came to sort of go into urban bait. What made you 
what made you do that? What made you take that leap? Well, I first started selling bait when I was 18. Um, right? Yeah, I first started selling bait. And I, we, we, me and Tony, we was the um, we used to help distribute uh, the Premier Baits. Yes, yeah, So yeah. what we used to do, we used to buy the ingredients, uh, mix them up ourselves and sell our base mixes um, in the late 80s. So, you know, I've always had um, my finger in the pie with bait. And, yeah. And, you know, what, I mean, in the old days, it was pretty much, you, you know, we make, we buy, sell 300 key a base mix and our profits, our 100 key. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, and that's our bait ourselves. That's how we started off. And, an urban bait was pretty much similar, really. It was more about me using the bait, catching fish, and people around me asking me what I'm catching them on. Um, you know, so that's how it all started. It was sort of a mate's thing. Out my back garden, you know, 20 key for him, 20 key for him, 20 key for me. And it was a bit of that, you know. And yeah. then I think it was with the start of social media and me doing my book that, people kept asking me what baits to use, what baits to use. And I was using the tuna and garlic yeah. and I, at, at the time. And, and, and that's what I started selling. And I, I put a post up on my Facebook page saying, look, cause so many people were asking me and I said, look, if anyone wants any, you know, it's under a key, it's six quid a key. And I woke up in the morning and I went downstairs and I must have had 50 messages. So that was the start of urban really. Um, it just come from nothing. You know, it wasn't planned. no, um, Pretty organic uh, then. Yeah, it was organic. And before you know it, I had the shops messaging me. I had, you know. Did pe- you want it? Did you Did you ever want it to be that? It got too big. It got too out of hand for me, you know, because all of a sudden something that was I loved doing and it was, in, was contained, it just was mad. It was crazy. Before I knew it, I had two units, people working for me, rolling machines, you know, um, accounts, teams, you know, sales, and it just it just blew out of all proportion in a, in a short amount of time. So it was, a, it was another big experience. How did you? How did how did that? Not taint, but how did that come across or or sort of reflect itself in your fishing? Did you find it harder and harder to have time to actually do any fishing? Yeah, I did. I, it, it helped me in some ways because um, obviously my my new girlfriend, now we should say my, my wife, yeah, who I married in 2004, 2005, she, um, she didn't want me fishing all the time. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, if I'm selling bait and that's my job. Yeah, it's it was, work. It was a bit of one of them as well. So it earned me a few nights. Yeah. It earned me a few nights. But and at the all- same time, as you say, the business has sort of boomed. Aye. And blew- then... <clears throat> yeah, my fishing went down up the wall for a while. There's loads of, loads and loads and loads of fishing I've missed out on. Loads and loads. But then loads that you've done at the same but time. But then loads that I've done and I'm still doing today, you know. I'm still I'm still fishing. Next week I'm out for a few days. If I had a nine to five job yeah. in, a, in the city centre, you know. I always find that like irony of like people... Like so, essentially, you you love fishing. Your your sort of mind and your bait and your experimentation has led you to to produce bait that catches for for loads of people, and then that becoming business then takes you away from fishing. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's isn't crazy. It, how it works? Yeah, yeah, that's right. You end up you trapping yourself, aren't you? <laughs> you? You're a victim of your own success. Yeah. Did you ever feel at one point like jacking it in and just saying, "No, I'll forget it. It's just not worth it." Well. At the fact that it actually earns me money to to pay for my bills and that I, I haven't had that luxury, yeah. you know. Um, as as much as I I love urban and, and with a passion, I love the base, I love the people that I meet, I love the people that I work with and stuff. So that to me is a, a massive part of me, um, you know. And, and I suppose that that's that's kept me going for it all, you know. The the passion of the bait and I love the, I love being around bait. I mean, this morning before I come here, I was at my back garden boiling up, um, a load of water to put in with my particle. And yeah. my wife's like, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm working with bait. What do you expect? So that's what I'm I working. Do, you know, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. you know, it's always been a massive part of me. So I was never going to go too far away from it. I mean, working for yourself is a really tough thing to do. Yeah really really is a tough thing to do um but it also has a lot of benefits in a fact 
that you've got other people who are working for you. And if you want to have Monday off to go and see your kids play at school or, you know, you want to go fishing for the first couple of days of the season, you can just say, I'm going. And that's it. So you have got that benefit, but you've also got a massive responsibility. So like anything, you're never going to get it all how you want it. No. There's always got to be a bit of give and take. And um, I can't live on the bank like I did because I've got a young family. My son is 12. I don't want to... You know, we him get to twenty five and say, "Oh, I never see me dad." He was always fishing, so there you, has got, to be you've a, got a couple of daughters, haven't you? Yes. They're older, yes. And yes. then you've got your son now. Son, my, my son now, yeah. Are either of your daughters into fishing at any N- point? No, no. What, what do they think about it? Um, they don't like it. They no, no. Nah, nah, that's it. They're you know, girls, girls. They're yeah, proper, proper girls. You know, they're not. Um, you know, they're not. Um, they're not into fishing at all. I, I took my daughter Nicole with me loads of times when she was really small and um you know once she was old enough to realize that she had spiders walking around in her tent and nah, not was, nah, nah i think the spiders was enough <laughs> Get on the head. so you know she, she that, my son was he's, he does his football and he loves his fishing and, yeah. and, and the girls were dancing and doing the girl stuff yeah fair play one chapter we got to talk about in terms of open baits Dragon's Den, mate. How many times have you been asked about this? Yeah, yeah. It's been like a cult moment in the modern day carp scene, yeah. mate. That was a big surprise for me. Um, Dragon's Den. Um, they they started to contact me. Um, oh, so they contacted you? Yeah, yeah. I didn't ask them. I thought you were... There's nah, an application process. No, nah, no. Nah, there weren't no application process. No, nah, I started to get emails from Dragon's Den. Uh, the first one was unbelievable. When I see it, I mean, my secretary at the time, Sue... She phoned me up. She went, oh, my God, I've just had a message from Dragon's Den. Yeah. They're interested in you going on their show. And I was like, what? What do they want from me? Anyway, um, I looked into it and I didn't want to do it. And a couple of mates of mine, they said to me, look, just do it for the advertising. Don't do mm. it for the, you know, don't do it for the the money that, you know, you might receive or whatever. Just do it for the advertising. If you don't want to do it, just do it for the advertising. You're never, ever going to get a platform like that. In a million years, you know, you're never going to get two million views. Yeah, big audience. No matter how yeah. big the fish are, you're catching, you know. So what I've done is um, I, I wasn't going to do it. A couple of people convinced me to do it. And I thought, do you know what? I'm just going to go um, and see what happens. So anyway, they called me in a, an, an, in, an introduction to it um, or an induction. Yeah. And I had to go to Shepherd's Bush, which is a BBC centre at Shepherd's Bush. Yeah. And I had to do a pitch in under two minutes. So there would have been a load of people there who've got businesses who have all been asked to come and do a pitch in under two minutes. And they want someone who can talk, obviously. Yeah. TV so, savvy, yeah. Exactly. So anyway, I've done a t- pitch in under two minutes. I know what I'm talking about. It's all about bait. I've done it all my life. Easy for me. Bish, bash, boss, pucker. Yeah, easy. <laughs> so the woman, she went, oh my God, you've done that easy under two minutes. Uh, we try another one. Done that under two minutes just done it easy and they just said oh you've done really well they said but listen we have to see lots of people today so there's a very good chance we'll never see you again best of luck with your life see you later and that was that and i was happy because shepherd's book shepherd's bush ain't far from me anyway i had to jump on the tube i was on the phone all the time anyway about three months later i got another email saying you've been accepted on the dragon's den can you come to granada studios oh my blah days. blah blah on this date, we will pay all your expenses and everything else. And it was nothing for me to lose, really. Nice. So I jumped on a train to Manchester Piccadilly. Yeah, you're up near me, mate. Yeah, up near you. I was thinking of you when I was up there. I was thinking, where come. is he? should have come up in the Jeremy Carl studio. I was. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I'll see ya. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, I, I, I went there and um, went in there, spoke to the all the producers and everything, done my pitch. We had to send a load of bait up there to show me through the pitch and everything. Yeah. Uh, there were some other people there pitching as well, got talking to them. Then we had to go and spend the day in the makeup room. So, you know, they sort of make sure your hair's all straight and stuff like that. And then they was giving us teas and biscuits. And then that was it. My name was called up and I had to go. I had to go in the famous lift. And, uh, and What then, was it like, mate? What was it like filming it? Yeah, it was a, it was, it was a massive studio. And there was obviously lights everywhere and loads of film, you know, loads of people filming and cameras and that. And I walked in there and I was a little bit nervous to walk out into front of the dragons. Yeah. You know, 
There was a line. They give you a line. You got to step on the line. They say, "Don't go past the white line." I walked straight past it. Got <laughs> you know what I mean? Gone. Just like yeah, no, Mister Dempsey, go back, go back. So that was that. And then the next thing, I just talked myself. I just was myself. Yeah, you could see I, that when I, you were delivering your pitch. Yeah, mate. I didn't try and hide nothing. I was just there. Look, I weren't. I didn't go there thinking oh, I need your money. I was pretty relaxed, thinking whatever happens, happens. I didn't even know if it was going to get shown because even after that, they still don't know whether they're going to show it. No, they still say to you, "We might not show it." Yeah, we might do. We might not. You know, if someone comes up better than yours, then we're going to show theirs, so, which is obvious. What were they like? Because Deb was it Deborah? She hated it, didn't she? She was like, "Nah, fishing. See you yeah, later." They did, but personally, I didn't. That didn't come across in did my it not? no. What what they what you see? It's edited, of course. It of course. I was there for ages, talking, laughing, joking. I was getting on well with them, you know. I reckon if I would have gone in at less money, I would have got them. But I went in at really high money because I didn't really, I, I'm not that business savvy to bring them in and I didn't know what to do. So no, nah, aim high, mate. I'm still a carpet angler, you know. Yeah, mate. Just, aim high, I'll get just, more hours on the bank. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Go on, son. So, uh, and there, there was a lot of jokes going around, I know. I've walked in there asking for 150 grand to go fishing. That's what everyone was saying. Take it, mate. I think you're worth that to go fishing, mate. Yeah, I'd oh, pay you that if I had it. Oh, um, me. Mate, yeah, but as an experience, off the back of that, benefits, did you get a lot I of did, um, Yeah, I did. I got a lot of knowledge from business that I didn't have. Mm. I got a lot of people come in and try to invest, um, which was interesting, which I wasn't that interested in. But I did learn a lot about business. I got a lot of business specialists who got in contact with me and sort of told me stuff that I didn't know. So, yeah, and even to today, they're still showing it. And every now and then we'll get 50 emails in yeah. a night. And we think, where did them 50 emails come from? And then the guy who runs my website, he, he, and my website is absolutely brilliant because when that Dragon's Den comes on, yeah. The amount of people that go on, it crash your website straight away. I mean, we had it the other month. It was shown in South Africa. Yeah. And we had all the South Africans messaging us. Then it was shown in New Zealand. We get all the New Zealanders messages. It's mad the power yeah. TV, isn't it? Oh, well, I think there is another YouTube video about me on there, the fish that got away or something. And I think that's got half a million views. Yeah, so, serious, mate. So it, really, it benefit like, like you sort of insinuated there, for you... The business side of stuff is the expertise you have, the pedigree, the history and everything in Bay. It's that business side of stuff that you benefit from. Isn't yeah, it? Like I've learned. Like that. That's right. Little things that like, I didn't know that I, yeah. you know, and stuff like that. And I've and I got good contacts. How did you feel about, you, you hinted to it again before, about the backlash and people taking the mickey? What, what were your thoughts about that? I think when you, um, yeah, no, it's, it's it, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's cruel, it's upsetting. But a lot of it was jokes. Yeah, a lot take. of it is banter, but yeah. the, uh, when you hear it enough, does it? Because it is, it, yeah. it's a massive move. Not much of fishing at the point when you went on had been on mainstream TV. Nah. There's a bit of monster cop, yeah, but there yeah. weren't anybody putting their head out nah. over the pool. Not like so, that. Not like that. No, that's massively. That's a, There's pictures of me with all my fish on the on the BBC that's all a big, over. It takes a big yeah. pair of. You oh know yeah, what, some mate. people, some people were nasty, you know. And um, but you 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 find that. Does that you? get you generally? Does that get you down or not? Yeah, mate? it does. Of course, it does. You know, you're, I mean, you seem very upbeat. Every time I've been out of you, every time there's been anything like that, it, it didn't seem to, to yeah. really bother you that much. No, nah, it don't. It, it, I mean, I'm old enough, and um, now I'm, you know, I'm in, I'm 50, I'm 51 now, so I'm not a young youngster. I've been through a lot in my life, so yeah, you know, it, it, it not not hurting me, you know, as such. But you know, it, it's it's upsetting. It can be upsetting, but it is what it is. You just it's a part of being. If you're going to be on a platform in front of 300,000 people, yeah. not everyone's going to like you, are they? No. And that is just a part of life, you know? It is. I mean, it's good for my son because when he gets older and maybe when I'm not around, he's going to show his kids it, isn't he? Yeah, so, of course. It's always is there, great. isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's a nice way of looking at it, isn't it? Um, before you take on the final test that is the Nash quickfire questions, mate, mm -hmm. one thing that I wanted to touch on is you as a person. You said there you've been through a lot. Mm. You said there that... You've experienced a lot in your life. Mm. We're definitely going to get you back in to talk about some of your modern day fishing, which we haven't touched on mm. in a bit on Wingham. But for you, how do you feel you've changed over the course of those sort of 50, what, how many years mm. you've been carp fishing? Yeah. 40 years? 40 years, years. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
I think now um, my experience of carp fishing is so vast that I've got so much, like when I get to a lake now, I, you know, I've got this experience, which is great to have, you know, of so many scenarios and stuff like that, which is brilliant to have. I haven't got one of the good things about what I do. I'm under no pressure to catch. Yeah. I'm under no pressure to catch. I'm not, I'm not um, a consultant. I'm not, you know, I'm not out there trying to prove anything to anyone. Yeah, you don't need So to. I'm totally, you know, my fishing is as free as a bird. I can fish the hardest lakes that I want. And even if I don't catch, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Because, you know, people are catching on urban all the time. So it's not just me who has to show that it can work. But so, on a wider aspect, you're, mate, you've got nothing to prove. You are proven, no, mate. Yeah, of course. Like people have said to me in the past, Top anglers have said, "Tell you don't need to catch another fish." You don't, mate. No, you don't need to catch another fish, and I know that. I am not fit to push your bank sticks in the ground, mate. That is genuine. You've caught, you've been through an incredible phase of angling, mate. Like you cut forty years and everything from like we talked about those chapters there, mate. They're literally like the backbone of carp fishing. It's mad, mate, when I think about it. It's mm. absolutely mad. It's a pleasure to talk to you about it. Yeah, and I'm still, now, the funny f- thing is, I'm still fishing for the, some of the same fish that I was fishing for that 40 years ago. Like, I've, I'm, I'm, like the reservoirs, I still fish the reservoirs, and I know yeah. they're still fishing the reservoirs what would have been there when I was 12, when I was fishing from. That's mad, isn't it? And Savoy's the same. Yeah. What a magic player. You know, there's fishing Savoy that are older than me. <laughs> Crazy. And I was fishing from when I was 19 and then again when I'm 50. It's a crazy old game when you think about it, mate. It must you, be for you. When you look at it like that, it is, isn't it? I think so. Mm. I really think so. I think there's a, so much romance in it when you've done what you've done and you've lived through that chapter and you've still got the drive in your mm. way and yeah. what you want to do. But now, I think it's a beautiful thing, mate. I've mate. got massive drive for fishing. Yeah. I mean, I've been... Like this last few weeks, I'm just baiting up. I'm still just as keen. I'm madder keen than I ever am, really, which is weird. I know. It's... Go on. Tell. What a boy. Right, mate. I've taken up enough of your time. But before you go, you've got to do the quick fire questions. No I've worries. I've just got to go and grab them because I can never remember them. <laughs> so, quick fire. Let's do it. in the title. It's got to be quick, yeah? Yep. Some of these are a bit obscure, so bear with me. UK 50 or foreign 70? UK 50. Bait boat or baiting pole? Baiting pole. Would you rather experience carp fishing 20 years ago or 20 years in the future? 20 years in the future. Dawn or dusk? Dawn. Never use a shelter again or never use a bed chair again? Never use a shelter. Um, Be a professional angler or a professional footballer? Uh, professional footballer. West Ham. I'm um, 100%. Up the Amers, mate. On an aside, 100%. I remember working for Anglian Direct, you come into Preston and then go to watch a bit of an away game on an yeah. open day coming back. I couldn't believe me luck there, could I? What? Touch? I've gone all the way to Anglian Direct in Preston and West Ham were playing across the road, wouldn't they? <laughs> it was classic, I said, Terry, mate. three o'clock, do you mind if I go? Yeah, go, mate. Get yourself <laughs> off, watch them. Did they win? I think we would tow one up, me and Paul Hamilton, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. What a oh, day. I've gone completely off the quick fire. Um, always tor- torrentially raining when you're fishing or 30 degrees and hot? 30 degrees and hot. All day long. Would you rather catch 10, 20 pounders or 140? Uh, 140. For the rest of your life, you can only listen to drum and bass or country and western. Country and western. <laughs> In a bucket or dig a hole? In a bucket. Uh, would you rather fish a two-week session without changing your socks or a two-week session without changing your underpants? Socks. Hook bait, um, colour choice, bright or match the hatch? Match the hatch. Camo or olive? Olive. Last question. Date night with the missus or hit the lake on the end of a big pressure drop and a southwesterly? Do I have to answer that? Well, yeah, it depends if your missus are watching or not. My missus definitely won't be watching this. <laughs> You're at the lake, boy, ain't you? All day long. A she knows that anyway, even if she was watching. That's brave of you and very good. Terry, <laughs> mate, you're an absolute legend. I've thoroughly enjoyed it, mate. We need to get out on the bank 100%. sometime soon. And I need to get you back in to talk about your modern 
absolute mega angling chapters because you've definitely got some, mate. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ascent. Thank you guys for watching and listening. Please, 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 if you enjoy our content, leave us a review, subscribe, leave us a comment. Thanks once again. Terry, mate, you're a lad. Thank you. Top man. See you soon.